Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Super Game Brothers podcast. This is a weekly podcast about video games and board games. My name is David, and I am your host, and I am joined, as always, by Devin, who is my younger brother. Devin, how are you today? I saw you a lot over the weekend, so uh, it seems a little weird to ask you that, but how are you today? I'm doing well. I've been tired recently for some odd reason. I don't know why. I feel like I'm iron deficient or something. Just woke up from a nap, actually, to do this podcast. It's a weird feeling, but I have a little bit of caffeine, and I'm I'm thriving. So, nice. Yeah, doing well. Doing well. Overall happy. So Good. So right from staring at a screen for, what was it, six, seven hours today to a nap to right back in front of the screen. That is accurate. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Guilty. Cool. Well, I mean, that's not much different from from my life too i spend eight hours a day staring at this screen looking at numbers and stuff and then the rest of my life staring at this screen making uh podcasts and stuff but it's a fun time we like it i've got a couple questions for you Devin. first off we just had a family vacation it was very fun we uh went to idaho out in the middle of nowhere, basically. That's where our grandparents live. And so we went out and visited them for Memorial Day. Went and saw some graves of loved ones, as one does on Memorial Day. Could you live out in a remote location like that? Oh, so that's my question? Oh, sure. Yes, I could. Uh, Without a doubt. Um, The only issue for me is... uh, I need to I need to find my person first. I don't want to go out there by myself, you know, just get eaten by a bear. And no one ever knows that I'm gone. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it'd be much easier. In the woods. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, hope she's not like a skinwalker. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I could do it for sure. I love the simple life. I really do. But I need to find someone else who does as well. And maybe I don't need to move to a place that's too simple. But. Maybe a little more simple than this city life. It's very, very busy out here. And I don't have too many complaints about that because I'm not driving too often. But it's not ideal when you do drive. Yeah. Yep, I agree. On the drive home, we drove a few hours to get back home. My wife and I were talking about that. Like, could we live somewhere out that remote away from basically everyone we know? And, you know, you're an hour away from the closest Costco. Probably half an hour away from a smaller grocery store. A little tricky. Amazon and things like that make it quite a bit easier nowadays. But even just dealing with the the Starlink internet up there was a a bit of a bear. So, yeah, if the internet worked better, I think I could do it. It is a little, yeah, it's crazy the difference. Like, we drove home into the Salt Lake Valley, and there are just buildings and houses and cars everywhere. And then when we were on the trip, you go outside at, like, 10 p.m., and it's pitch black because there's not even another house for, like, I don't know, five miles or something. And Yes, I woke up. Dark. It is a little scary. I woke up one night at like 3 a.m. And I think this happened to a lot of us. And you open your eyes and you can't see any better than when they were closed. Yep. And it's a little scary. It's like, what's going on? Am I blind? I don't know. And I just went back to sleep because I don't want to deal with it. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I could live out there for sure. But there's got to be a few things. Got to have better internet. Uh, got to have your people with you. I think, you know, you got to have a few people out there. I think you might go a little crazy. Yeah, I think um, so too. You might, uh, go a little Jack Nicholson on that. If you're too alone, I think. Yeah. And then the last thing I would say is just, if you're a worry wart at all about safety or maybe your kid's safety, it's not easy to just, you know, there's not a hospital n- next door. Mm hmm. You know, emergency items and like you said, a Costco or whatever it is, is typically inaccessible for 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's crazy. And a mountain lion or a bear might just or moose might just, uh, you know, walk in your backyard. It's 
it is crazy out there. Those are some tough people that, you know, have the pocket knives and moose walks up. They'll just punch it in the face or something. I don't know what they do. (laughs) Because I feel like if I saw one, I would run. And then probably the bear would chase me and eat me or whatever. But I feel like those are real men up there and would just kill the bear with their bare hands. I'm not sure. But yeah, it's it's a weird, weird place. Yeah. I really love it. I think I could live up there, but the internet would be the thing. I, I need it to be a little faster. You Even don't like for- buffering in a YouTube video? <laughs> no, no, don't don't love that. me neither. Um, yeah, a little buffering from time to time. You know, I'll get over it, but always buffering and no whatever you're trying to watch. That's no fun. I have a question. I, sure. What's up? Do you think that Starlink or deep space satellite internet will be the main source of internet ever? You think we'll be able to get those communications so quick and everywhere where that will just become the thing to do? I don't know. I feel like I need to know more about science to know that because as I'm guessing, they, mm-hmm. the main limiting factor is the speed of light, right? Because I think that's the fastest, you know, we can send a signal is the speed of light. And so if I, if the speed of light can travel through an Xfinity cable and it only has to go like, you know, 50 miles, is that how far away is the satellite? How many miles up is to a satellite? I don't know those basic science things that I should oh, probably know. Me neither. Then we got another issue. Have you ever seen a picture of how much debris and garbage are in space? No, is it? Is it dirty up there? I mean, I don't know that most of it is garbage, but um, let me see. Uh, That's not a great picture, but there is a ton, ton, ton. There's some great pictures that you can find online about how much stuff is in space. So there's like satellites and the space station and then like bits of debris and old asteroids or whatever else that are going like 18,000 miles per hour. And so they're in orbit. And so they're not going to, you know, leave orbit or they're probably not going to slow down and hit our atmosphere and burn up. So they're just kind of floating up there. And then like in the movie gravity, if you happen to be floating slower than that, they'll just pummel through your, uh, spacesuit anyways the main point will there eventually be so much space garbage that uh the signals can't get through that would be worrisome as well Mm. but i think the the distance is probably the main factor and can you get more speed if you have more satellites up there because if we're if we're capped out at speed right now then whatever we just experienced over the weekend isn't going to cut it so I don't know if they need to deploy 10 times as many satellites to make it work better. I'm not sure. Interesting. See, I thought space was like extremely clean. Um, but it's, I mean, that's good to know. Like if you got lost <laughs> up there, maybe you'd come across like a floating garbage can. You can make your home or yeah. something. Yeah. No, okay. I really didn't know that. Very interesting. Yeah, you'll have to Google a picture of that. It's it's very interesting. There's a lot of stuff between us and the and the moon. And it must just be so small that like the light from the moon um just kind of goes around it so we can still see the moon without like little specks in front of it, but there's a lot of stuff up there. So yeah, I don't know. Starlink, it's a uh I feel like it works better for some people because I have heard good things about it, but it was not great in that location for whatever reason. I don't know if like weather affects it too, like clouds. Uh, Mm. I really uh, know very little about this thing. I'm trying to have a conversation about. (laughs) Ah, yeah, I'm completely (laughs) lost. Yeah. I was going to say, just kind of following up on your comment on how dark it was when you woke up in the middle of the night. I also did that. We were in this weird place that had a bunch of bunk beds in this room and I was on a top bunk with my, uh, five-year-old because he was a little scared that night and i woke up had to pee like crazy and i was like nope too dark i'm gonna either fall and break my leg or like run into some demon monster in the middle of the night so i just went back to sleep which would you rather mm, i'd probably rather fall and break my leg than uh experience a demon monster Mm. (laughs) Devin would rather see the monster he's like all ready for that 
I want to get scared in life, kind of, but <laughs> then I don't think I would love it in the scenario. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm I'm in a bit of a weird circumstance where if I broke my leg, as long as it wasn't life threatening and I wasn't going to lose too much blood, I've already hit my uh, out of pocket maximum for all of the health insurance buffs listening out there. So I could get my hospital stay and everything for free. So. There would be no financial incentive for me to face this demon, is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. In, I don't know how insurance works. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it was a good time. Lots of green, lots of bugs and dirt, and kids having fun, and it is really peaceful out there. And the views are are great. So it was great. We played some good games. We'll talk about those later. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask you, Devin. I'm kind of running into a pickle here in my office space that you can see behind me. So I have this board game shelf behind me. It's a five by five. So you can see those squares, right? I think they call it a Calyx shelf. Mine's technically a different brand. It's not from Ikea, but I think Ikea is the first one that made this kind of shelf. Very popular for storing board games on because the you know shelves can hold you know, four to six games generally, four if they're really big, like on this shelf right behind me. And then if you have a shelf with a bunch of little games, you might fit 10 or 12 or something. But So it's five by five. And if I get five games per shelf, what is that, like 125? I didn't do this math beforehand in my head, but I think that might be right. That is right, times yes. five. Um, I have 300 games, so I'm always in this dilemma of that's too many to fit on the shelf. And so I have to keep some in my closet in my uh, bedroom, which is okay. I do usually have a segment of games I'm trying to sell. So that's okay for me to have the ones I'm trying to sell somewhere else. The problem I'm running into now is that sell pile is pretty big. I've got a pile that we're giving away um, as part of our Super Game Brothers and gaming top-down giveaways every month. Make sure you check that out just as a little plug here at uh, supergamebrothers.com. Um, and then I've also got a bunch of new games and games I haven't played. And some of them are on the shelf. Some of them are on the floor behind me strategically so that you can't see. So I'm, I'm going to do, be doing a few things. I'm going to be purging some games that I feel like it's time for them to go. And I would really love it if I could get all of my games on this shelf with maybe a few of the extra large boxes up on the very top. How would you organize a shelf like this? Would you like do it by, I've, we've had a few different situations here in the house. My wife likes them organized by color. So we'll do kind of like a rainbow spectrum of just colors, which looks really cool. Hard to uh, fit everything as efficiently as possible. I've also stored them by how complicated the game is. If it's like a super simple game, they go on the bottom shelf and then like the more complex they are, they go higher up. Can also be a little tricky to be efficient with in some of the, the spaces. Uh, what I'm thinking I might do this time to help me clear up some space is I only put a game on the shelf if I've played it and it has to earn its place. So basically I'll have a pile somewhere else of games I have that I own that I haven't played yet, which will hopefully incentivize me to play them. And then I can decide if it's worthy of the shelf or if it needs to, uh, to go. So lots of thoughts here, trying to fit them all in here. I don't want this room to look like a hoarder room and we're not there yet. You know, I got the plant in the back that's, you know, only partially dying. And, you know, we got some nice Mickey mouse art behind me. So, doesn't look like a hoarder's room yet, but if I get too many more games in here, it's gonna. Anyway, so that was my question. How would you organize such a shelf if you had one, Devin? Um, can you do a five by eight? What if we just get rid of that little desk behind you and go all the mm -hmm. way to the wall? That's a good question. I don't know if they make a five by eight, but I think that they make a five by one or five by two, maybe a five by three that I can just set next to it. Yeah, if I would think about that because, I mean, you're not even close to fitting all your games on there. 125 of 300. I mean, you almost need three 5x5s. Five five I do have yeah. some thoughts. Okay. Um, this is just how I would do it because 
sometimes things are really hard to stay consistent with. If I were to sort those by color or alphabetically or difficulty, I th- I try to do that with laundry sometimes. It just doesn't last. Mm-hmm. You know, eventually they're just getting thrown wherever, wherever there's an empty space. And so that's how I would do it. Uh, because if you were to do it alphabetically, some games are much smaller. Some games are tiny card games. Yep. You're leaving all these gaps. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the hard part. And, and then you've got it all set up and then you buy a game that starts with the letter S and you have 10 other ones. And you're like, oh, crap, I have to fit it in the middle. Exactly. If I put it in the middle. I have to move the other nine. And if I move those nine, I have to move all the R's and the P's. I don't know, whatever letters come around S. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I think that's right. I Yeah, I would truly do it to where you're just getting the least amount of space left in a square. Yeah. Yep, that's kind of what I've defaulted to at this point because uh, just out of necessity. Because I bet you I only have, let me count real quick. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I probably only have 30 games not on the shelf. So, I, I mean, when I say five per shelf, that's, or per square, that's probably a little not correct on the average I'm getting. On some of these bigger ones towards the top, yeah, I can only fit four or five, but I bet I average like eight, maybe. So, there's not as much going on as it, or missing space, I guess, as it might seem, but still some room that needs to be cleared up. So that'll be one of my projects for this weekend, I think. I want this room to oh, be fun. feeling nice so that I'm more excited to, you know, be in here and maybe even have my wife come in and play a game with me because every time she sees this room, she's like, what is going on in this heathen garbage hole? I actually understand what you're saying. Yeah. My streaming room's like super clean. Um, but for anybody that doesn't know, I run a 50 foot Ethernet cord from my stream room, out my window, up the house, into a bathroom, into a, into the router to stream. And I have to step over it every time because it's barely long enough so it floats above the ground and it drives me <laughs> nuts. Even when I don't even have to be by the thing, I'm just looking at it, I'm like, are you serious right now? Mm-hmm. And it's, so I understand wanting it organized. Yeah, even when it's not in the way, like you mentioned, you're just seeing it across the closet. The amount of like uneasiness and anxiety it like fills your brain with that could like be spent on better things is crazy. So yeah, that's kind of the the goal here. I want this to be a peaceful room where I peacefully destroy everyone that plays games with me in here. So Exactly. You should get a <laughs> diffuser as well. Oh yeah, for reals. Get some mood lighting, a diffuser, have it super clean. Get a couple more plants to go with these snake plants behind me. We'll be vibing. Cool. Well, yeah, fun stuff going on in the Bailey households. This is, like I mentioned at the top, our family-friendly weekly board game and video game podcast where we talk about news in the board game industry and the video game industry and the board games and video games we've been playing lately since we play a lot of games and we have been playing games for decades. And then we just generally have a good time. Let random tangents pop in and yeah, really appreciate you listening and following along. Please make sure to follow us on Patreon um, so you can see kind of our extra videos that go up on there. A lot of them you can view totally for free just by following us on Patreon. And then we do have some other perks there if you want some bonus things. You can get the show early, get even more bonus episodes, get your name in the credits, all kinds of stuff. So check us out over on patreon.com. Like I mentioned, we have a giveaway going on right now too. So this is the month of June's giveaway is about to start and the month of May's is about to end. So we'll be giving out the May prize shortly. Should announce the winner probably next, early next week since June 1st will be I think Saturday, so over the weekend. Um, That was a $25 gift card to either Steam, PlayStation Network, or Amazon, whichever you would like. This next month in June, we're doubling it. We're doing a $50 gift card. Or, if you would like, I do have... Give me 10 seconds. Not even 10. Give me 3 seconds. I'll grab it. Chair stream. I said 3 seconds. That was a little more than 3, but... um, Through the power of editing... 
it will only take half a second. We're giving away a copy of Auric Alchem, which is a super awesome uh, kind of race game. You're trying to build a new Atlantis because Atlantis has sunk into the ocean. And you do that by taking these tiles, kind of mapping out a new world, and there might be some monsters on the tiles. And you keep track of your points on the top of your board in these five notches. And the first player to have five points on their turn wins. So it's a race to five points. Very fun game. I really enjoy it. You can see it on my shelf right back here. I've had it for a while. Got another copy. So going to be giving that away. I can only ship that in America, though, just due to the cost of shipping a big box with uh, heavy stuff inside. So... If you win, we'll let you choose either of those things. If you're outside of America, we'll default to the $50 gift card. So make sure to join the giveaway, supergamebrothers.com to do that. I'm just going to set this game down real quick. All right. I think that might be all the housekeeping. Make sure to, uh, you know, do all the things. Follow us on social media, like our instagram and tiktok posts that helps us a lot to share them with your friends you know the whole whole shebang there we always start our show with what we call the news mini nuke this is basically just any small news items from the board game or video game industries and so that's what we're going to start with today and we always start with the game announcements and trailers first up we have a new board game that was announced by Stonemeyer Games. They have an entire shelf dedicated to them behind me here with Wingspan, Tapestry, Libertalia, and Apiary on it. I also have Red Rising and a couple other of their games. One of their biggest, longest, and most popular games was called Scythe. And it probably came out eight years ago or something. And then last year, I think kind of Scythe's little brother came out. It's in the Scythe universe, they say, but it's a shorter game that I think tries to retain a lot of the feeling and the gameplay of Scythe, but play in a, on a smaller board in a, a shorter time frame. And that was called Expeditions. That was a lot of backstory to say that Expeditions is getting a new expansion. Um, that expansion was announced by Jamie Stegmeier, and the expansion is called Gears of Corruption. And yeah, it looks pretty cool. has some cool new uh, mechs in the box and some new meeples and cards. And I think the two major focuses that I could see, at least from this first post from Jamie, is that it adds an Automa solo mode. I believe made by the Automa Factory. They do really great solo modes for games, and I think they've done the solo mode for almost all of Stonemeyer's games. And then a sixth player feature. And I think one of the other things it does is it helps, I guess, Expeditions has, for people that are really into like min-maxing the points, a bit of a first player advantage which is pretty common in board games if you go first you generally have some sort of advantage but i think this expansion kind of nerfs that first player advantage a little bit so looks like some cool stuff he said in the post that it will be out on stonemeyer's website on june 5th in like a standard version and what they call an ironclad version that i think is just more fancy components and then I think it's going to be uh, shipping throughout June. So not exactly sure when it will hit other retailers. But if you like Expeditions, I have yet to play Scythe or Expeditions, but um, would really like to play that at some point. So that was kind of the big game, uh, board game announcement from the week. Next up, we got a few video game announcements. First one is No Man's Sky Adrift. This is a new mode for No Man's Sky. They've had so many expansions since that game came out. And I know this is kind of the... When people point to a game that was really rough at launch and is now like super, super awesome, No Man's Sky is the one they always compare to. Because that's basically exactly what happened with them. The game was pretty bare bones and people were really upset at them for a long time. 
but they just kind of went quiet and slowly updated it. And I think this might be like the 20th free um, expansion they have released. And a lot of them have been pretty substantial, like adding like whole new mechanisms, like, okay, now you can build bases and okay. Now you can buy more than one ship and you can have a freighter that can, all of your ships can like be housed inside and you can fly that freighter from one solar system to another solar system. And then introducing new land vehicles and like sandworms and all kinds of crazy stuff that they've done. So really uh, applaud them for this expansion called Adrift. um, I'm just going to read this quote from Push Square because I think that they explained it pretty well. They said, this new update named Adrift introduces a whole new way to experience the game. It adds a new abandoned alternate universe in which you are the only intelligent life form. In this universe, there are no shops, no trading, no shortcuts, and no help of any kind. It's an entirely solo experience and a more hostile one than the regular game. This more dangerous version of No Man's Sky includes sandworms that are free to roam, fiend eggs spreading across planets, and other aggressive forces, end quote. So, if you like No Man's Man's Sky, seems like a cool kind of solo survival mode added to to that game. I need to really try this game again because it I haven't tr- played it since it first launched and I fell off it pretty quick. Um, but I know that, you know, it's just another one of those kind of lifestyle games where kind of like Minecraft, if, if you play No Man's Sky, that's basically all you're going to play for six months. You could probably pop in and out of this one a little easier than something like Destiny maybe, but it is kind of a big giant game that's best with friends and best played over months i think so look for I would that like to you... try it too actually um when does a drift come out did you say i think it's i think it's out right now oh okay, okay. unless i misunderstood his uh, blog post but i believe it's out right now i might try that actually that sounds kind of fun it's a scary yeah. mode to get super immersed in it yeah yep i hope it's a good one all right next up skull and bones is ubisoft's kind of pirate game that they spun off from the naval combat that was in Assassin's Creed Black Flag. And I think it came out last year or maybe early this year. I can't remember. And it, uh, it might've sold well. I don't remember, but I don't think it is retaining its player base very well. But for anyone that loves Skull and Bones still season two is now live has a bunch of free stuff. And yeah, I don't know, just kind of like free events and, new things you can join the coolest looking thing to me was this giant shark they called it i think the the megalodon on there so if you want to uh, play that game and be afraid of the megalodon because sharks are water t-rexes and are terrifying then uh be sure to do that that's well said yes (laughs) Uh, yeah they're the worst um let's see another little point about skull and bones when you're listening to this, it will be May 31st on Patreon or June. What is that? First, second, third free on, on YouTube. They're doing a free trial of Skull and Bones from May 30th to June 6th if you want to try it out. So you don't have much time, but you've got a little time if you want to go try that game out for free. So check that out. All right. Then we've got just a couple little announcements that I thought were interesting looking ones. The first one is called Arsene Lupin Once a Thief, and it's releasing at some point uh, later this year. Kind of looks like a detective game where you are... Yeah, I'm not even 100% sure, but I believe you play as some sort of Sherlock Holmes-looking character. So, anyways, if you like that kind of game, I thought the art style of that one looked really cool. And it's supposed to be coming out later this year. Supposedly, this uh, character, Arsene Lupin, was kind of the inspiration for the gentleman thief in Persona 5, which is you know kind of like a whole thing. So anyways, if you like that kind of puzzle detective game, maybe check out the trailer for Arsene Lupin. And then next up is a visual novel that I believe was pretty highly rated when it released in Japan two years ago it's coming to 
out in English and to consoles and PC um, in August. It's called Toyotoki Arrival of the Witch. I'm very picky with these kind of you know Japanese visual novel games, but every once in a while there's one that I've you know, really enjoyed. So um, check that out if you like that kind of game too. Trailer looks pretty solid. And then last thing that I thought was just kind of funny more than anything. There's basically no Nintendo news this week. I think they're kind of holding their cards, you know, close to the vest. Is that what they call it? Close to the chest? Close to the vest. The vest is on your chest. (laughs) The vest is everywhere. (laughs) Holding your cards close to your vest. I think that's what it is before their um, Nintendo Direct next month. But they did announce today a new Lego set, and it's a Legend of Zelda Lego set. The Lego set looks cool. It's the big, great Deku tree. Has a few minifigs. I think Link and Zelda in a couple different um, game and a armor sets. Looks cool. I think it's twenty five hundred bricks, which is quite a few. Devin, how much do you think this uh this set costs? Unless you already saw the number. <laughs> I didn't see the number. Uh, twenty five hundred. I'm gonna guess each piece is twenty cents. So I'm going to go with quarter of 2500 which is $600. Hmm. Okay, well, maybe I shouldn't be as upset. You, I mean, you're not too far off, and some of them are crazy. The Lord of the Rings one that was just announced, I think, a couple weeks ago, I think was like 600 bucks. It's the Tower of... What's that called? The Tower of Orthanc or whatever? I don't know. It's the tower with the Sauron's eye on it. Hmm. Uh, this Zelda set is $300. But, you know, coming from the Mario sets that were generally like 50 bucks, you know, quite a bit smaller, but 50 bucks. And then you can get like little add ons for 20 or 30 just seemed expensive because my kids love Zelda right now. And I was like, oh, this will be really cool. But I don't think I can buy them a $300 Lego set. <laughs> it's a lot of money. It's for crazy what they're able to charge for these things. That is what I was going to, to ask you is if you th- think that they're getting away with highway robbery or i mean legos are really cool and they have like i think patented like their whole connection system or whatever and the amount of things you can make with them it's like very awesome and as someone who lived in denmark for a couple of years like danish you know founded company i think they're very cool man they can charge a ton for those little tiny pieces of plastic I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel like you're almost them, buying the sentimental value of it. It's like mm-hmm. a collector's piece for a lot of people. It's like, I'm going to build this. I'm going to really cherish the time that it took to build this. And then no one touch it so I can look yeah. at it. And I almost wish they yeah. had like two different sets of each one. Then like this is the collector's version. All of the pieces are like the highest level quality um, within like. Point zero zero one millimeter yeah. or whatever. And then we have like the set for kids to play with. And it's like the pieces aren't quite as perfect. Uh, you know, maybe we don't spend quite as much time making sure the colors and the paint and everything's perfect, but kids are going to play with this. So it's 40 bucks instead of 300. I don't know. It just seems like they're getting away with, <laughs> with like big purchases for kids because the collectors will pay so much for something. They just know, okay, well, that I can set the price that high, and then, you know, Grandma grandma Lego Lady will buy it for Billy because he wanted it because Grandma Lego Lady retired and is super rich, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. The set looks really cool, though. So for it any does. of those Lego lovers out there, uh, check out the set. I think you can build two different versions of the Great Deku Tree from two different Zelda games, I think from Breath of the Wild and Ocarina of Time. All right, those were the announcements. Really quick, we have the free games of the week. These are games that have been added to subscription services, so they're technically not free since you have to pay for the subscription service, but you know what I mean when I say free games. Sony has announced the PlayStation Plus Essential games. They should be available on Tuesday, June 4th. The three games are SpongeBob, SquarePants, The Cosmic Shake, on PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4. Streets of Rage 4 
and AEW Fight Forever, which is a uh, wrestling game. I am really excited by this uh, lineup. I love like retro games, so Streets of Rage like looks very cool um, to me. That's like a fun one to play with, you know, kids even because kind of similar to that Ninja Turtles game that came out a couple years ago, Shredder's Revenge. That was like super awesome. Just a brawler. You all play as a character, run around, beat the crap out of bad guys. I punch a dude in the face and then huck him over my shoulder, and my son catches him and you know smashes his head into a dumpster or whatever. You know, just really uplifting and the best things you can teach your kids just how to be extremely violent, punching strangers on the street. So I agree, though. Those kind of games are super nostalgic for me. Remember the yeah. like the uh, Power Rangers ones or mm-hmm. just. I don't remember what other ones, but yeah, yep, those and Battletoads and Double Dragon or even yes. the, the vaunted Battle Tro- ba- La- Battletoads Cross Double Dragon game. That one ruled really liked that one what would you call this type of game it's like 2d but it's not because you you have depth you know what i mean yeah that's true i think when they say like a 2d brawler i think they that you just know that you've got a little bit of depth on that road that you're walking back and forth on so even though it is technically not 2d because you're not always forced on the same plane it's close enough that i think that's what they call it Maybe they call it 2.5D. They use 2.5 in some things, like for a Metroidvania game. If the artwork is 3D, but you're playing in 2D, they sometimes call that like 2.5 or 2.5D. So maybe they call it that. Uh, that SpongeBob game, I also want to try. I They did a remake of, what was that called? Battle for Bikini Bottom that I think came out on PlayStation 2. And me and my kids liked playing that one. I don't think we quite finished it, but we played quite a bit. And this Cosmic Shake one, I can't remember if it is also a remake or if it is a new SpongeBob game. But, uh, you know, I like I like some silly SpongeBob here. Patrick doing some crazy things. It's a good time. So I'm excited to try both of those out. Don't really have any interest in this wrestling game, but I'll try the other two. We have a few more PlayStation Plus free games that we'll talk about, but we're going to talk about them in the news segment. So. You know, just put the, put a pin in that for just a moment. All right, then on the Xbox side, we have a few games announced for Game Pass in June on Xbox Wire. They were still listing the last couple that came to Game Pass at the very end of May. So we got those two are Humanity, which is a cool puzzle game, and Lords of the Fallen, which is a very cool Souls-like, pretty tough, but fun game. Both of those were available on Game Pass on May 30th. Humanity on console and PC, Lords of the Fallen only on, oh no, on both, on Series X and PC, so yep. Okay, the couple that they have announced in June, I'm guessing they're holding a lot of these announcements again for their June showcase, which might be on the 9th, I can't remember the exact date. On the 4th, they have a game called Firework coming to PC, and again on the 4th, they have another game coming to console pc and cloud called rolling hills make sushi make friends and i if i don't have game pass currently but if i did i would totally try that one out it looks uh, silly and colorful so maybe it's a good time and then on the 18th they have kind of a walking simulator story game looks like it might be going for some creepy vibes i couldn't quite tell but it looked like you're alone on an oil rig in the ocean and the oil rig is maybe breaking which would be terrifying um oh, so check man, that out that one's the worst on thing yeah that would be terrible on june 18th all right next up on the epic game store they just uh they knew we started this podcast and so they wanted to drive me nuts and just keep all of their games as mystery games forever <laughs> we had Last week, the mystery game that I wasn't able to tell you about was Farming Simulator 22, so I hope you got that one in time. This next one that should be available tomorrow morning from when we're recording still says mystery game, but it might have leaked. There are some rumors online that it might be Chivalry 2, which is a first-person, like, sword-fighting game from, like, medieval times. Um, Doesn't really look like something I'd be interested in, but it's got an 82 on open critic and IGN gave it a nine. And so I'm like, okay, well maybe I'll try it. I don't know, but 
maybe that isn't what it's going to be at all. But that that's the rumor at this point. So look for that again every Thursday. They have a free game on the Epic Game Store. So add those to your library. Okay, and then Amazon has announced the free games for Prime Gaming. If you have Amazon Prime, just add these to your Amazon uh, library. Some of them require you to redeem a code elsewhere, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But, you know, free games, I uh, recommend adding them to your library at least. The big one is Star Wars Battlefront 2. This is the uh, classic version from 2005, not the new one from DICE. So, uh, but I think that is the most well-loved of all of them. So I really liked that game growing up. Really good time. That one is available on June 6th and you would get a code for GOG, which I think stands for good old games. It's just another store, another launcher, but you get a free code from prime weird West definitive edition is next again, June 6th for that one. And you'll get a code for the Epic game store. I've heard good things about weird West as well. I haven't played that one yet though genesis noir again june 6th and that one you can just add to your library right on the amazon games app same with everdream valley right on the amazon games app on june 13th myth force on june 13th it's an epic game store one this one blast brigade versus the evil legion of dr creed on june 13th via gog i don't know what that is Cool. I don't know if cool is the right word. Interesting name. Uh, Projection First Light, also on June 13th on the Amazon Games app. So, again, add all these games to your libraries. Even if you don't want to play them now, you can uh, play them later. In 2075, when you still have Amazon Prime. So, there you go. (laughs) As we all will. (laughs) Yeah. All right. And then the last segment for the news mini nuke are the new games for the week so the new video games this week there were four that looked uh, notable to me the first one is f124 which is a f1 racing game they have a new one every year i believe it comes out on may 31st and it's sitting at a strong 82 on open critic i really like racing games but i generally generally like racing games that are just barely more arcadey than like full-fledged racing simulation so like i like gran turismo and i don't know what f120 what the f1 games are if they like focus on a hyper realism or if they focus on like you know the other end of the spectrum or things like need for speed where i can whip a ferrari drift around like you know four city blocks and nobody cares and my tires are just fine um or in gran turismo if i do that everything would explode and i'd lose so I think kind Forza of might be the there. sweet spot. Yeah, and even Forza has two games in their series. They have the mainline Forzas, which I think try to be Gran Turismo. Oh, okay. And then they have Forza Horizon, which is their more arcadey version. And yeah, I uh, I kind of go back and forth. Some days I, I'm like, yeah, Gran Turismo is super fun. Like the system where you race online and you have like a karma system. So if you're like bumping into people you'll get bad karma and they won't put you in races with people with good karma so you're incentivized to race clean which is like really cool but it takes like another level of like focus and dedication to learn like how those strict like uh handling and braking mechanics work and like heat tire overheating and stuff and i feel like if you like those games you really have to be playing them with a racing wheel And then you probably need like a whole room for that wheel and the four screens you're going to have in front of the wheel. So I I think they're really cool, but I generally like, I think my favorite racing games were drive club was one of my very favorite ones. That was just a little bit more arcade than something like that. You didn't have to worry about my tires popping or whatever, but still tried to have realistic handling and project Gotham racing, which was also really, really cool. They haven't made that in a long time, but Really liked Project Gotham Racing. So yeah, if you like racing games and if you like F1, F124 sounds like it's uh, pretty good. Wanted to give a shout out to an indie game that I forgot last week, but should have been on there last week. On May 21st, Paper Trail came out, and it also has a strong 82 on Open Critic. Has really cool art, and I think it's 
a puzzle game kind of about origami and folding these like paper pages. If I am understanding correctly, I am super into puzzle games right now. And so that one is like, you know, it reviewed well, cool art. So I'm very excited to uh, try that out probably one day after it's on sale, but um, I thought it deserved a shout out. All right. Last two multiverses did relaunch. It had a beta like a year ago where you could fight as Bugs Bunny against Batman or Gandalf if you want to, but it has officially launched now in version like 1.0. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the news, but it has a strong 79 on open critic, which seems uh, okay for that, that kind of game. And it seems like it's has quite a few players right now. So we'll see if it has the, the legs and the staying power that I, I know they're, they wanted to. And then last up in video games is horizon chase two. This is an indie racing game that kind of tries to capture the vibe of arcade racing games from like the nineties. This is the second one. I think I have the first one and it's a, it's a good time. The second one looks like the graphical like choice they went with is a bit more high fidelity than the first one. It's got a strong 75 on open critic. All right. And then last up we have the new board games this month. We've talked about a few. I wanted to just highlight here before the month of May is over the seven board games that I think are the most interesting to me that are coming out this month. Um, So some of them I've already mentioned in previous weeks, so I'll go over them really quickly. Um, But here are the seven. First one is Sand. I've talked about it a few times. I've played it a bunch. I really enjoy it. It It's about a two-hour game, plays one to four players, published by Devere, and it's a kind of a medium complexity game. On the complexity scale, they call it the weight scale. It has a three out of five. So, you know, it's a pretty complex game. Takes two hours to play. It's sitting with a pretty solid uh, review rating score on BoardGameGeek at 7.7. Anything above a seven is like really great. If you get close to eight, you're in like the excellent territory. So that's a a good aggregate review for them right now. Next up is Let's Go to Japan, a much lighter game. Its complexity level is 2.1. It takes an hour to play for one to five players. Published by AEG, who publishes good stuff. And it has a 7.9 actually on BoardGameGeek right now. That one I think is a, a drafting game where you're trying to like have the best vacation in Japan, if I remember correctly. And so you're like setting out what you're going to be doing that day on your trip to Japan. Next up is Sphinx, spelled S-F-Y-N-X. This is a one to four player game. I imagine most people will play this one solo because it's being published by Inpatience, who publishes almost exclusively solo games. They've published, I think, the entire Oniverse series and Scoven Tour and some other games that are basically solo-only games. And it's kind of a puzzle game. You're trying to manipulate this grid um, in order to win. doesn't have a, a weight or a, a rating score yet, so maybe it comes out right at the end of the month, but it was marked for me. Next up is a big one that... I think has delivered to Kickstarter backers, but is coming is out on the company's website. And I don't know if it's coming to retail or if you have to buy it through them, but the publisher is called Bellows Intent and the game is called an age contrived takes two hours to play for one to five players. And you play on this big board, you play as like this animal God and kind of the coolest part about this game is your player board has these little like square domino tiles that go inside of it. And then you like pull back on this mechanism with a spring in it. And the pieces like slide down and then launch forward. And so you have to program a little bit like, okay, if I put these here on next turn, I'll get to slide them to the right. And then I get to choose one of these spots to activate. And by pulling back on this spring thing, and when I pull that, it launches those actions forward and I get to do those actions. Um, so a bit of a puzzle trying to figure out that, but 
it looks really cool on the table. I don't know if the gameplay would sit like as well with me as I want it to. It's like route building and area majority out on the board, but that player board is very crazy. I think it's even metal with some magnets in it maybe, but uh, also a pretty heavy game. 3.45 on the heaviness scale. It's got a 7.3 currently. So if you missed that Kickstarter campaign and wanted to check that game out, I think it is available on Bellows Intense website. Next up, shout out to Bitewing Games. They are also in Utah. This is Cascadero. It's a game that was designed by the good Dr. Reiner Knizia, whose name I'm going to try and say every episode of this podcast so that uh, Devin eventually knows who he is. <laughs> Knizia. Um, Kenizia, yep. It's a two to four player tile lane game. Plays in about an hour. 2.25 on the complexity scale, so not bad. And it's got a 7.5. I think it's kind of in the vein of Through the Desert and Reiner Kenizia's other tile lane games. A couple small card games to round up the list Courtesans and Far Away, both from Pandasaurus Games. Cortisons plays two to five players in 30 minutes. It's a set collection game with a little bit of take that, it looks like, which I don't usually like. But the way the cards look looks really cool. So I'm interested, even though it does it has a little bit of take that. It's a pretty simple game. 1.6 on the weight scale as a 7.4 currently. And then Far Away has been very, very popular. Um, at least on online forums. So I think it's getting a bit of buzz. Two to six players, 30 minutes. This is one where you play cards out in front of you and then you score them at the end of the game in reverse order, so backwards. So you have to plan out how you're putting those cards in front of you. 1.8 on the weight scale and 7.6 on BGG. So yeah, those are the games for the month of May that I thought were you know notable ones that i've been thinking about maybe getting and i already got sand so i put my money where my mouth was there <laughs> so that is the uh that's the news mini nuke what's your uh pick of the week Devin, for the video games or board games that we talked about in the news mini nuke mm, multiverses seems funny to me but only if you're gonna play with friends paper trail i can also get into puzzle games maybe yeah maybe not as much as you uh sand seems cool that new game you've played multiple times now and i was looking yeah, at the really let's cool. go to japan one and the art style looks hilarious it looks like it could be yeah kind of it does have well. really cool art really cool art that was four Good answers choices. but there you go no i love it <laughs> i uh i brought sand on our family vacation <laughs> ah. uh, but that was that's not a good one to bring to like a family outing you know um but i was thinking if there was ever a time when it was just me and you and maybe like one of our other siblings or cousins that really likes games, we could play something like that. But didn't that that opportunity did not present itself with uh, a <laughs> mom and dad wanting to play games and stuff. All right, next segment of the show, we talk about what we've been playing. We've been playing quite a bit. So Devin, let's start with video games this week, and I'm going to start with you again because I've been uh, talking a whole bunch, and you can take it whatever direction you would like. Yeah, um, the video games I've been playing. Let's see. We just finished playing Skyrim. Uh, fantastic game. Funny game. Has a million issues, as I've found from Bethesda games. Um, I've got a question about Skyrim when you're done talking about it. Yeah. Um, we are done with that game now. But the last day we played it, we decided to add a couple mods. So we had a lightsaber. And there was some mod that said it was going to turn the dragons into Charizard, but they got lazy. And instead of the dragons looking like Charizard, the dragons were just the color of Charizard. Mm. And so that was silly. Um, we couldn't really find any good mods on PlayStation. I guess most of them are on Xbox or PC. So we were pretty limited to that. Um, we still have a lot to do in Skyrim, but when you stream a game, people force you to get the coolest items in the game so early on and like, do the DLCs and all the most exciting stuff first. And so we were left with like, go get a carrot for Esther. And I was like, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to do these. I don't want to do these missions. I don't want to get a carrot for Esther today. And so we moved on from that game. Um, the only other game I've been playing, we started Mass Effect. Legendary edition today. Um, I think from what people were saying, it has had a remaster. The game actually felt really good and smooth 
as far as visuals for a game from 2007, I was very impressed. Um, but I was also calling the game Dialogue Simulator, a lot like Bethesda games. Um, in the first few hours, I mean, I think it was an hour and a half of talking to people. Yeah. But the game's fun. It's funny. I like the upgrade system. They're very generous with level ups in that game, in my opinion. But we are just on normal difficulty. Um, I'm thinking of just skipping to the second one because everyone says it's so much better and the combat's better and a little easier to maneuver and figure out probably some updates compared to the first one. But I don't know too much about the game yet. Everyone's calling me Shepard. I don't know what that means. I didn't name my character Shepard. I named him for, and everyone's still calling me Shepard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think Shepard is the character's like default name. And so they'll either call you like Shepard, or if you chose to be a female version of Shepard, the short for that on the internet is Fem Shep. So are you playing Fem Shep? Fem Shep? Oh yeah, that's used uh, very often. <laughs> because we don't have time to say female shepherd, you know, we gotta say fem shep. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. It makes sense. What's your Skyrim yeah. question? Sorry, I just like flew past that. Oh no, you're good. I was just gonna ask. Now that you've played probably Bethesda's two biggest games, you know, Fallout Four and Skyrim, what's kind of the comparing them? What was the feeling you got? Which one do you like better? What's the vibe? Which ones do you want to play next? You've got in the like Elder Scrolls series, you've got Oblivion and Morrowind. In Fallout series, you have Fallout Three. Um, what what would you be most intrigued to go to, and which one did you like better? I wish that Fallout Four and Skyrim could have been made the same year. Yeah. So that I could really compare them side by side because Skyrim had beautiful a beautiful upgrade system and a few things that Fallout didn't have. Um, but the aesthetic of Fallout is just better, in my opinion. Some people love the whole Viking, dragon, medieval, vibe. yeah, fantasy vibe. It's not as much for me. Um, I didn't hate it. Like, I thought it was a beautiful game, but Fallout is just the coolest aesthetic of game. The most amazing music. I could listen to Diamond City Radio every day for a while. Skyrim kind of lacked in a lot of areas as far as music went it was just very silent it was like i was just wandering and there's just no noise um both fantastic games but i like my guns i like my guns in video games i the magic in different things and the shouts in skyrim were cool but once again it's an older game and i was going into these quick tabs and trying to select my next power there weren't really quick quick ways to do things in Skyrim. It was basically, oh, you're going to die. Go to the pause menu. See if you have a potion in your list of 400 potions that can quickly heal you. And then right as you get out of the pause menu, make sure you push up on the D-pad. Choose what shout you want to use. After you use that shout, go back to the D-pad menu. Pick a different effect. Mm -hmm. That type of thing. Um, a little bit tedious. It could have just been smoother. If there were better keybinds, I think, for Skyrim it could be a little more enjoyable to play, but overall beautiful game. Hilarious. Both of those games made it worth your while to just explore and do random things. You never know where you're going to get a random mission. I walked up to a door and it was just like new mission started. I was like, that's interesting. So they're really incentivizing. You just explore this entire world and you'll have things to do. And so both yeah. games were fantastic, but I would choose fallout four and I would love to play fallout three as well. Yeah. Cool. Good to know. Yeah, that Fallout vibe, I feel like, is a little more unique, right? Even though there's a lot of post-apocalyptic games, there's not a lot that, like, are exactly Fallout that, like, focuses on the vaults and focuses on, like, really hard, we're going to stick with this 50s or 60s vibe, and you got, like, the music. And so even though, like, post-apocalyptic and fantasy are both, like, genres used a lot, I don't know, I do feel like Fallout's a little more unique in post-apocalyptic than Skyrim is in fantasy. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I haven't played Skyrim um, more than a little bit. And the part where you're, like, absorbing the dragon souls and stuff is cool. Um, but it doesn't seem quite as, like, at least from a aesthetic and the setting, quite as unique. Cool. Well, um, are you going to get an N7 sticker for your car? 
<laughs> we had someone actually send an N7 tattoo that they did for their sibling in Discord today. Mm. Um, I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm going to. I actually don't know what N7 is. I'm sure I missed <laughs> it in the lore. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. I don't know, fully know what it is either. I haven't played Mass Effect yet. If I do play it, I'll play this Legendary Edition like you are, because it is the remastered nice version that came out you know, four or five years ago or whatever. Yeah, you'll see a lot of those N7 stickers on cars when you're driving around. I think, you know, Mass Effect has a big, big audience that loves it. So excited to see uh, how well you vibe with the rest of that series. Yeah. Even if even if the first game is probably a little rough, the roughest going back to it is like even talking about Fallout and Skyrim like you just did. It seems like the quality of life changes just from the four years between Skyrim and Fallout 4. You know, just those little things do make a difference. Going back to older games is sometimes rough. But cool. Fun stuff. As far as video games is concerned, I've been playing um, a lot of the same things still. I'm playing five games right now that I need to finish. Uh, still haven't finished Prince of Persia The Lost Crown. Still playing Bellatro. Still playing Animal Well. It's my favorite of those three currently, but I don't know. Bellatro still great too, but... Um, the two that I've been playing a bit more this week, I played some more of Sekiro Shadows Die twice. Um, I've got it recorded. It should go up on Patreon soon. I'm not exactly sure when, but again, join us on patreon.com slash supergamebrothers if you want to see some of those things. Sekiro is still great. I got to, let's see, I'm in kind of that first memory area where you go to the burning estate, the Harada estate. Right, like yeah. Night and everything's on fire. And you have to fight um, Hihachi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wolf. I think you don't <laughs> fight Wolf until the end of the game. And the first time you go there, you fight like the old lady up, up in the rafters. But maybe you're talking about there is like that mini boss in front of the building. That has, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. and does he have a poison that, damage? Like a poison he attack? He does, yeah. He, yeah. I'm not quite to him. I'm right before him. Um, and yeah, some of those mini boss fights that they put before, like the actual bosses, whew, they can be really tough, especially with all the other ads running around. That game's brutal. It's very hard. But still really love it. The uh, When you can go like a few minutes and you're just like super nailing all your parries and, man, and your Makiri counters, I think that's probably the best feeling thing to do in the game because it's such high risk. The Makiri counter is when they do that lunge attack at you and you step on their blade and push it down. Yeah, right? you have to push forward, don't you? You either have to or push something? forward or not be holding a direction. In fact, I, I don't even know if it works if you're holding forward. And the rest of the time you're playing, you're generally holding the analog stick in a direction away from the boss you're fighting because you want to dodge away from them. And so if you're going to commit to that Makiri counter, it's basically, okay, I'm... I, when I push this circle button, I'm not going backwards. I'm either doing it at the right time or I'm getting impaled. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh -huh. it's, it's a tricky, tricky one to nail, but good feeling. So yeah, I'm right before the Hihachi dude that you're talking about, just in that super burning area. Really love that game still. The other game I've been playing, kind of spurred by Animal Well and I think some other puzzle games I've been playing lately. Super into puzzle games. Wow, they're great. Especially if on the Steam Deck or you know on the Rogue Alley, which is what I've been playing on, just playing a puzzle game in bed. Or I I took my ally with me to Idaho and I was just playing this game while I was there. And just so fun to just do a level or two while we're sitting on the couch watching basketball or whatever we were doing. Uh, this game is called Baba Is You. <laughs> what a weird game! Whoever thought of this is just like super smart, and I hope they made tons of money. I think they did because this game is like very well known in the puzzle game world but basically you play as this little sheep character called baba and you're trying to solve all these puzzles and how you do that is each level has some text on it it'll have the pieces of text form little mini sentences and so the first level like pops up with four things it says rock is push flag is win um, I forget what the other, a wall is stop. And then the last one pops up and says, Baba 
is you. And the crux of this game is anytime you can move that sheep, like um, up, down, left, right, anytime you can move and get to those sentences, you can move those words around. So Baba doesn't have to be you. Flag doesn't have to be win. Rock doesn't have to be push. That's just what it is from the onset of the level. And so sometimes they'll put those words like locked in a corner so you can't mess with them so that you have to solve the level a certain way. But other times it lets you do funky, funky things. So if you're able to push a word over, like if I push rock over to Baba is you and then push rock into Baba's place, now rock is you and I control all the rocks on the level. Or <laughs> you can do like the craziest things. There's this one level where there's this like river of lava separating you from the flag and you can't change like the flag logic and so you think for a minute you're like man i can't really do much else but then you push um is and baba over by the like lava word and now it says lava is baba and the lava turns into 75 baba sheep and then you control all of them and just walk over to the flag and so it's all about <laughs> breaking these sentences and i do think that there are in a lot of cases, multiple, multiple ways to beat each level. So it makes you feel smart. Again, I love puzzle games that make you feel smart. And man, the game rules. It's so good. I think it's 15 bucks if you buy at full price. It's on Switch and Steam. I think those might be the only two places. I have been playing it on Steam. I, it was on sale for 30% off, so I got it for like $10. And it's amazing. There are dozens and dozens of levels. As another plug for our Patreon, I, this was our Patreon exclusive Super Game Brothers Advance episode this week was me playing Baba Is You. I played it for two hours, probably played like, I don't know, 25, 30 levels. Most of them I did okay on. A couple I got really stuck, um, but we made quite a bit of progress and man, that game rules. It is so good. If you like puzzle games, <laughs> it's just... It's amazing. Um, so big, big props and shout out to Baba is you. Just uh, everyone needs to play that game. I, I wish I was smart enough to make games like that so that I would be the one that's like making you know twenty million dollars from from making a little game about a sheep. But alas, here I am just being the consumer playing Baba is you. But even just doing that, I'm I'm just happy and having a good time. Um, yeah, that's really it for me. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about Bellatro and Prince of Persia and Animal Well until I make some more progress in them and have something new to say. So Baba is you and Sekiro for me this week. As far as uh, board games are concerned, I have played four this week. Two of them we played on our family vacation. So I'll talk about those last so that I can get Devin to talk about one of them too. I think we've maybe talked about this game in the past already, so we won't spend too much time on it. As the audience can probably tell, I am very much obsessed with Devere Games lately, who made the game I'm going to pull up on the screen for the 75th time, Sand, and a new game that I got last week that I showed on the screen but I hadn't played yet. I now have the White Castle. Very awesome game. So I played both of those again this week. I played Sand solo. I raised the, the difficulty and played against the medium difficulty solo enemy. And man, that game's great. I've got the whole playthrough on my gaming top-down YouTube channel. So check that out if you want to see how Sand plays. I played it once on easy and did beat him, which was nice. And then I played on medium after I'd played it a couple of times multiplayer as well so i feel like i've got the strategy down pretty well and in this uh medium playthrough i decided i wanted to try a different strategy and i'm kind of surprised at how many different strategies there are in this game i really like it so you start at the very top of the board here at the uh, the harbor and the farther you get from the harbor you can get more rare and expensive goods to sell the problem is you can't sell most of those unless you get back to the harbor to sell them. And movement is this in this game is one of the 
bottlenecks, the limiting factors. It costs a lot of resources in your your silkworm's health, thirst, and hunger to move across these uh, shortcuts and the paths. So that that's a hard thing to do, to shoot for all the way to the mountains to get the most rare resources. But I decided that's what I was going to do. I was going to shoot all the way to the bottom as quickly as I could and get as much good stuff as I could. And yeah, it went really well. I had a really good round of the game. Crushed my record for points. I did still lose to the uh, solo bot, but only just barely. So it felt pretty good. I On like the last turn of the game, maybe it was second to last, I can't remember, but I, I was able to cruise back to the harbor with a bunch of the most rare rocks and got like 100 points on that one turn, which was such a cool feeling. If I was <laughs> on the opposite side of that coin, if I hadn't been able to pull it off, it would have been really disheartening. If the game ended and I was like one space away and only scored, you know, 12 points because I wasn't able to finish that. So you have to be careful. Make sure that you know how many movement spaces you can afford to go. But sand is really great. My favorite pickup and, de- pick and deliver game I've ever played. I think it's wonderful. So played that one. Also played the White Castle, like I mentioned. It's a simpler and shorter game than Sand. And in this game, you are trying to be the Japanese clan to gain the most influence in this uh, White Castle. And you do that by taking nine turns. You only get nine turns the entire game. And so it's this game is all about having turns that combo so that by doing this one action, it lets me you know, I do that and place, I get to place one of my samurai over here in the training grounds. And by doing that, I place a die of the right color, maybe. So I get to then combo that into an action over here where I get to put one of my dudes in the castle. And then I get to combo that into a move where I get to put one of my gardeners over here on the river. Uh, super awesome game. I love when games take like a at like an easy turn structure. All you do on your turn is take one die. You can take you take them from one of these three bridges and you can only take the lowest die or the highest. So you have six dice out of all the dice that are on the board to choose from that you can take for your turn. Take that one die, place it somewhere, and then do whatever that spot says. And that's your whole turn. But it does take a bit of thinking because you're like, okay, if I do that action, it'll combo into this action and I have to have this many steel or pearl resources to be able to pay for that second action. So I need to make sure that I don't spend too many on the first action. So lots of combo goodness in the White Castle. I really like it. Excited to play it some more. So Devere, man, just firing on all cylinders lately and it's really gotten me wanting to play Bamboo again which I, I have behind me on the shelf and it's been a little bit since I played that. So I just might, I just might go full Devere and just have a Devere shelf. We'll see. Um, the other two games we played, we played on our trip. Devin um, only played one of them because the other night he like zonked on the couch or something. I can't remember, but I fell asleep uh, with my shoes on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's a, that's a rare occurrence. The shoe sleep. Oh, yeah. Were your, were your feet hot? I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, but the, the first game we played the first night is a party game. We played it with a big group of probably 10 or 12 of us. And this game's good for that. You can play with up to six teams. And so we just had you know people play in teams, which is a, a good time. It's called Half Truth. And I think we've talked about it on the show before, so I won't spend too much time. But... It's a trivia game where you don't have to be smart or good at trivia to win. On each turn, there will be a card that comes out. I've got this upside down. A card will come out, and the card has some question on the top, like movie that's over three hours long or some question. And it has six answers to that question beneath it. Three of them are true. Three of them are false. And you're trying to place or choose the ones that are true and you only have to play one chip down but and you'll get all the points for the round or you can double or triple down if you really think you know them to get some extra points it's a fun time really like it for a for a party game there's like 500 cards in the game 
I've played it multiple times and still haven't opened the second box of cards yet. And there are five boxes of cards. So I really think this game could last you like dozens and dozens of plays, even if you had a photographic memory and memorized every card you saw. So lots of value there for sure. And the pieces are really nice. They're big, chunky poker chips. So I, I think it's a very solid party game. Devin, you've played it a couple times now. Uh, we yeah. played it at a different family event a few months ago. What do you think about Half Truth? Just uh, in a brief here. I think it's funny. Um, we talked about it being risk management, basically. Uh, yeah. Because you're not going to know most of the answers. You might know one thing on a card, or you might know nothing on a card. Mm -hmm. And so you're just guessing. Um, it's funny to play in teams. I don't know if it'd be better in solos or teams. Maybe teams, because then you have two brains trying to guess the answers, but that can also complicate things because yeah. when you're guessing, you think your guessing ability is better than your partner's <laughs> guessing ability, and then you're yeah, both totally. wrong. But no, it's funny. Honestly, brings people together. It's fun to play the game in different ways, go all in, and just hope for the best to try to get some points. Yep, but. I agree. I think it's a fun time. You know, it's not an amazing game, but for a party game, it's one of my favorites just because it's simple to teach. Um, some of my other favorite party games are like Decrypto, which is really cool, but man, it's a little tricky to teach. You have to have two different teams, and each team is trying to solve a code that like part of their team is giving them, while the other team is trying to like eavesdrop on the code and figure it out. And so they have to give clues, but make sure the clues only make sense to their team and not the other team. Very cool game that I think is like a like more awesome or cool game. But it's so much trickier to teach that Half-Truth just makes it to the table way more often, even though I don't like it as much. Just because the, easy, the ease of teaching it like is a big deal in party games for me. Right, yeah. And, and I love teaching games like teaching games is basically what I do. Every time I play a game, I'm teaching either my wife or Devin or, you know, any of my neighbors or whatever, how to play basically every play there. I don't think I've played a game except for the two times I've been to this other game group where they are all like very hardcore gamers. They have taught me the game in that scenario, which is actually really nice to just be the sitter and not the talker. <laughs> um, but it's a different level of pressure because then you're like, oh, man, I need to listen. And if I don't understand this right, I'm going to look like an idiot in front of all these people that have played this game a thousand times. Anyway, so Half Truth is cool because of that. It comes out really easy. And everyone that I've played it with, I think my family members are like, well, this is the best, coolest party game I've ever seen because they don't see a lot of, you know, unique party games. But um, anyways. That's Half Truth. It's a good time. The other game I played, which I just still love every time, more and more each time I play it, is called Cat in the Box. It's a little card game. comes in a little box. And it's a trick-taking game. So similar to something like Hearts or Pinochle, or I, there are hundreds and hundreds of trick-taking games. One of the most popular, re more recent ones is called Skull King. So if you've played Skull King or Hearts or Pinochle, um, something like that, you know the idea. Each round has a bunch of tricks. A trick, everyone will play a card. You have to follow the suit of the lead card. Whoever plays the highest value card of the lead suit wins the trick. Unless someone plays the trump suit, then the trump always beats the other suits. Anyways, the crux of this game is that every card is black and is suitless. So how do, how do you play then a trick taking game where suit is so important? There is this board in the middle that has four different colors, green, yellow, red, and blue, the four different suits for this game. When you play a card, you get to decide in that moment what suit it is. And so you take this little token um, that is unique to you and you place it on the color that you are assigning that card for the turn. So if I play a, uh, wanted to play a blue seven, I would play my black seven card and then place my token on blue. But you still have to follow regular trick-taking rules. So if Devin led the suit with with uh, yellow and I decided I didn't want to play yellow, 
I wanted to play blue, I have to take a token off of my own individual board on yellow. Because in trick-taking rules, you must follow suit if you can. So in that moment, I've decided that I have no more yellow cards in my hand. So I remove that from my board to show that I can no longer play yellow this round. And so it kind of messes with your head in like the way that a trick-taking game works. It follows basically the same rules, but since every card's black, you have to have to you have to put tokens out to keep track of that, and that can be a little more tricky to teach. But it's super great, super awesome game. You get a point for every trick you win. You lose a point if you ever create a paradox, which is a weird scenario where if there are five of each number in the deck, there's only four suits. So if the red, blue, yellow, and green five have all been played, and there comes a point in the game where I must, I have to play my five because I don't have any other cards that could be played, I have to play that card down, and there's no, none of that card left, so I've created a paradox. And so that round ends immediately. And then since I was the one that created the paradox, I would lose a point for every trick I won that round. So you have to be careful not to create the paradoxes. And then the other, only other part to the game is before each round, you bet on how many tricks you think you'll win that round. And if your bet is correct, then you get a point bonus. And your point bonus is the largest number of your pieces that you have segmented together, not counting diagonals. Um, so you're incentivized to cluster your things together, to bet correctly, but then you're also incentivized not to paradox. It's a super awesome game. Cat in the Box is very popular if you like trick-taking games. One of the most popular ones of the last decade, I would say, in trick-taking. So very cool game. It was a hit there as well. And I think it was nice. One of our cousins that I don't think like is especially... That's not a nice way to say that. I'll say that nicer. I don't think he uh, would be great at playing a lot of complicated board games. Had just come from a different family outing where they played Skull King. So it was a really easy transition in that way because I had just played one. So if you like trick-taking games, Cat in the Box is super awesome. That was a lot of games, Devin. We played a lot this week. Proud of us again. <laughs> you played much more than I did, but yes. Oh, I mean, maybe in number because I'm hopping around all the time. You know, I was played Bob as you for like four hours. Then I played Animal Well. Then I played Sekiro for two hours. Then I played, <laughs> whereas Devin was like, oh, I played Fallout 4 for 90. And then I played Skyrim for <laughs> 75. And Mass Effect, you've already played for like seven. So, you know, just different playing styles. And that's that's totally fine. All righty. Last segment before we go into our closing question of the week is we talk about the news that's going on in the board game and video game worlds. There is not much board game news this week, so we're going to lead with that. Uh, we already kind of talked about the Expeditions expansion that was just announced, and that seemed to be the big announcement this week that I could find. There was a couple other things I wanted to shout out, though. The first one, I didn't know that this existed, but this is a cool initiative. There's this project or competition, I guess, is the better word for it called the cardboard edison competition and basically it's a competition for people to submit their board game designs that they've designed but only games that haven't been published published means you know they've been printed and are available to buy are eligible for this competition so it's basically a whole bunch of game designers that maybe haven't had a game published or have before, but you know, have some games that um, they're designing. They, they can submit these games to this competition and it's an annual competition where they choose a winner and a first runner up and a second runner up. I didn't know it existed. Super cool initiative. The winner this year was a game called crowded frontier, which uh, yeah, looks really cool. Like a very solid worker placement game as this cool mechanism where you, get to place a building out on the board in one of nine like regions. If you take a meeple from a region on the left side and the top of the board, you get to place a building where they would intersect, which is a little complicated, but um, yeah, it looked really cool. So I think there were, you know, tons of games 
submitted. That one was the winner designed by a guy named Miles Wallace. And it's an annual competition. I think you have to have your game submitted before January. So if you want to do that, you're much cooler and smarter than me. But I thought that was a cool thing. I'm guessing Miles Wallace and maybe even this game will probably be picked up and published now. That seems to be what has happened with the last few winners, at least. So that was cool. Wanted to just point that out as a cool initiative. And then last up, we're just going to go through crowdfunding corner. So these are the one, two, three, four, five, six games that I thought looked cool, interesting, maybe worth backing on crowdfunding this week. First up is we talked about this a few months ago when it was announced, maybe a few weeks ago, I can't remember. It is the new expansion for Oath, the game that's made by Leader Games, kind of in their uh, it's not a sequel, but the game that came after Root for them. And my neighbor has Oath. We're, we keep talking about it. I think we're going to try and play it sometime soon. So I'm excited for that. And this uh, expansion looks cool. I love the artwork in Oath. It's a very complicated heavy game. On the heaviness scale, it's above four. Um, which <laughs> I have... I can't remember if I have a single game above four. I have a couple in like the high threes. But I, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a very, very complex game with lots of moving parts. And kind of the crux of Oath is that the game remembers how you played it last time and it kind of morphs so that if you play it with the same group of people, um, you kind of have your own history that you write down in this journal of what has happened throughout this land. Cool game idea. Kind of a tricky, tricky thing to pull off. And it's a tricky thing to pull off playing even because I need to have the same game group. I can play this three hour game with multiple times. <laughs> that That's a hard thing. Um, and that's why root doesn't get played for me as much as I want it to just because of, again, hard to teach best. If you play it with the same group over and over again, and it takes a lot of time, but Oath looks super cool. Wanted to give that one a shout out. Next one, we talked about this again when it was announced, but it is on uh, crowdfunding now. This is Terraria, the board game. I was surprised. This game looks uh, more complex than I thought it was going to. It's uh, 120 minutes, which uh, for most of these like licensed games, like you know, there's a Minecraft game that's actually pretty solid. I bought it for our younger brother, played with him, really great. But it's like a 45 minute game, you know. That's kind of what I was expecting for this Terraria one, but two hour game where you go about. It's a co-op game, so you're running around with your friends, mining stuff. There's all these cards that dictate what you um, have mined when you go down a mine. Upgrade your character with these really cool pieces. They're like transparent cards. I couldn't tell if they were like paper cards or if they were plastic or like resin pieces. I couldn't tell. But they have a piece of armor on them, and then the rest of the card is transparent. And so when you get new armor for your character, you set it on top of your character board and then it looks like your character is wearing that armor. And since the rest of it's transparent, you can still see all of your stats and everything else. So I thought the components looked really cool as well. I, I couldn't tell too much else about the gameplay, but it looks really cool. You fight these cool bosses. I think there's five or six bosses in, uh, in the box that you can kind of mix and match with the different scenarios. It's on crowdfunding through June 21st. So check that out, especially if you love Terraria, which I know has a huge following. Um, I haven't played it more than 10 minutes, but you know those kind of crafting games aren't really for me because I like hopping around to so many different ones. All right, next up, actually the next four <laughs> were uh, kind of unique ones. I feel like a lot of games are being kickstarted in bundles lately. It's probably risky to like kickstart a single game because if it doesn't get any interest, you just make zero dollars. And so they're kickstarting a lot of these games in like, here's a bundle of two or a bundle of three or five games that we are grouping together. You can buy one individually if you want, but we hope you buy the discounted price bundle of all five of them or whatever. And so that's what these next three are. So this next one is two tiny little card games. 
it's called the first one is called masters of syrup and the second one is called downstream and they're from a company called firestarter games and i thought the idea was really cool they're in tiny boxes two player card games but they look like a little more intense and involved than just like you know let's play speed or uno um yeah i, I really like the idea i think they look really cool they have really cool art and just looking at the game mechanisms, you have to like tap cards to like show that you're producing syrup or you're shipping the syrup or whatever in the first game. And then in the downstream game, the card that you take might move the canoe forward and you have to, you can decide if you want to take the top card of the deck or you can flip the deck over and take the bottom card of the deck. But once you've flipped it over and looked at it, you have to take that one and then the canoe moves a couple of spots or something. So very cool ideas. And I thought they, the artwork, like I mentioned, looks really cool. So I hope that those, uh, those do well. Next one, very big board game company, 25th century games. They're doing a four game bundle. They're kind of four card games with, you know, boards and stuff. So they're a little bit bigger than like a tiny card game, but they're kind of four card games. The four games are Big Sur, Sand Art, Grand Central, Skyport, and Wine Cellar. And I know like the Sand Art cover has been floating around for a while with the cool different colored sand. And I know that people are pretty excited for this campaign. 20th, 5th, can't talk today. 20th, 5th, 20th? <laughs> what 25th century games they make really good stuff <laughs> what was i saying 20th fifth <laughs> yeah i liked it better honestly yeah yeah sounded like a fancier 20th fifth century games um yeah they make they make good stuff so i think people are excited about this they also have really great artwork one of the games the artwork is done by vincent dutre who does amazing art in games another one of the games, the artwork is done by Andrew Bosley, who also does amazing artwork. There are two of like the like most top tier artists in the board game world. So very aesthetically nice looking games. And I think they look good. Also pretty good pricing. Four games for like 75 bucks. And the shipping wasn't too bad either. You know, in today's day and age, that's a pretty good deal for for games. And the wine cellar one especially looks very unique. Like these really long cards that represent wine bottles and then i think the longer you have them like in front of you they like age and get more valuable so cool ideas again i don't know how solid the games are but they look pretty good uh, next collection there's this collection called the 18 hex game collection they've done a kickstarting campaign in the past so this is volume two and their idea is really unique too i don't know if i'm going to buy any of them but i think it's super cool Every game comes in a very small box. The box is shaped like a hexagon, and each box has 18 tiles in it that are the shape of hexagons, like the box. And so every game they make in this hexagon, what they call it, 18 hex series, has 18 tiles, and they start with that framework. Then they've made a bunch of games. They've made 12 different games in this series. And then, again, you can choose. I just want this one or this one, or... You can buy like just this volume two set, which is six of them, or you can buy this set and the volume one, one set for all 12 of them for a bigger discount. Very cool looking. I love games that are small. Don't take up a lot of space. Um, I have struggled at times with like how much variety can you really get out of always using like the same number of like uh, game components. Like even button shy games who does the little card games and the little wallets. I think I showed one an episode or two ago. Um, they have some really solid games, but then some of the other ones I'm like, okay, this game feels like that other one or this game, you know, cause how different can it be if you're using 18 cards? So I wonder what the difference will be there too, but the artwork on the games looks pretty good. So hopefully they've got some good variety in those volumes. Then the last one I wanted to give a shout out to is not really a board game per se. It's more of like a, a design system. It's basically Crokinole where 
you can design your own rules and your own levels. So it comes with a bunch of pieces of wood that are little ramps or pins that stand up or cubes and blocks that get in the way. And then a bunch of discs that you flick. And then with all of those pieces, they like, include a bunch of like pr- uh, their recommended play sets. Like, okay, here, play with this set. And in this uh, level set, your goal is to shoot the puck, the disc, off this ramp and land it in the cup. And if you do that, you get a point. And then in a different one, your goal is to knock down all of your opponent's pins, similar to like that cube game that we play outside in the backyard. Um, And then you can just kind of, with all of those pieces, build your own kind of stuff. I think it looks really cool. I don't think I'm smart enough to build like uh, anything good. So hopefully they have a bunch of like those pre-made sets that are like, yeah, use this and this, and this is a cool game to play with that. And then use this and this. And this is a totally different one, but I'm not sure how much variety they'll be able to fit into that framework. But the pieces look cool. And as someone who really loves Crokinole, I think that's a cool idea to try and take like a big outside game, like something like Kube, and fit it on a tabletop. So that was the last project that I wanted to give a shout out to. Some cool projects this week, Devin. Of those uh, six, which one is your uh, crowdfunding corner pick of the week? Mm, oh, that's tough for me. Um, a lot of those had cool art styles and cool game pieces. Mm-hmm. <sighs> the one that I might highlight two, for me is the Terraria. Yeah, it looks cool, huh? Yeah, it really, really does. It reminds me of the game from last week, the Children of Morda uh, board game that was based on the video game that had the very unique like pieces. And so I feel like some of these companies are doing a really good job at translating a video game into how can we make this a a board game and then make it a board game that's cool and has like some unique hook to it. So I think that's a great choice. Thanks. Some very cool ones. (laughs) There are hundreds of games in crowdfunding every week, so I can't, you know, talk about all of them. But those ones were the ones that stood out to me as I was scrolling around the interwebs. All right, last up, we've got the video game news of the week. I didn't forget it this week. Like, I thought you were going to. I was, I was ready. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's, shooting. he's going to the end segment. <laughs> yeah, uh, quite a bit of video game news this week, so we'll try to go a little quick. First up, we've had a lot of rumors this month about Sony holding a state of play or a showcase, and they have finally announced that they are doing a state of play. That state of play is going to be tomorrow from when we are recording. So we'll have to talk about all the stuff that they show next week. If our podcast ever does get big enough that like people would want to not be a week behind on this knowledge, then we would record a pickup tomorrow. So basically we'd record the show today and then record for 45 minutes more tomorrow. And then I would combine them before it posts on Friday. Um, but tomorrow is my 11th wedding anniversary. So I'm going to be busy. And I don't think anyone listening at this point is going to be that like (laughs) sad about us being, you know, five days behind on these announcements. So, um, so we'll talk about everything they do announce next week. Let me tell you what the details they had in the post. They said it will be 30 minutes long and focus on 14 plus games, whatever that means. So it's going to focus on 110 games and, (laughs) um, Their quote there is updates on PS5 and PS4. Man, I'm struggling to read things today. Updates on PS5 and PSVR 2 titles, plus a look at PlayStation Studios games arriving later this year, end quote. So first things that that tells me, this is a state of play, this isn't a showcase. They're not going to talk about the PS5 Pro, right? It's probably not smart for them to anyways, because the moment they say anything about that thing, Nobody's going to buy a PlayStation 5, at least for a while, till they figure out like what the thing's going to cost and when it's going to be out. And So they probably want to hold that as long as they can. And then late summer, they'll be like, oh, yeah, next month we're releasing this new thing. You know, that seems to make sense. Uh, next thing it kind of points out to me, 
since it's not a showcase, kind of makes me feel like they don't have any huge games that are going to hit this year. That also matches what I think their CFO guy, I forget what his name was, said in their financial earnings that they weren't expecting any like huge profits until their next uh, fiscal year, which starts in April of 2025. But then they were expecting, you know, some big games to drop then. So it seems like they'll probably have a few small things, well, a few, a uh, small game or two from Sony First Party this fall. And that probably matches the quote there, a look at PlayStation Studios games arriving later this year. But nothing big. The next thing that makes me think is that Wolverine is probably not coming out this year anymore. When they first announced the Wolverine game, which is being made by Insomniac, who makes Spider-Man and Sunset Overdrive and Ratchet and Clank, they announced that it was going to be 2024, I believe, unless I'm remembering incorrectly, but I think it was going to be. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore, or else I don't think their CFO would have said that, hey, we're not expecting this Marvel game to sell super well. Um, so that those seems to be the three things that I learned from that little statement. So we'll see what they uh, what they announce tomorrow. It's at four o'clock Mountain Time. I think that's three o'clock Pacific Time, and the audience will have a little bit of a, a heads up on us, even if they uh, follow social media. I thought maybe we could uh, just mention a few predictions. It seems like uh, God of War Ragnarok is kind of been leaked as the next game that's coming to PC, and so that'll probably be announced there. I would imagine. And then the next things that everyone thinks are most likely is that Sucker Punch, the team that made Ghost of Tsushima, hasn't made a game since then. Um, That was four years ago that it came out. So it's probably likely that they could announce Ghost of Tsushima 2. That would be kind of a big deal, though. So if they do, I don't know that that'll come out this year. Probably be like announced with a 2025 date or something. The team that made um, Astrobot Rescue Mission for PlayStation VR, they also made that Astrobot. Uh, what's that called? It's that kind of demo. It's more fully fledged than a demo, but when you get a PlayStation 5, it's the thing that comes pre installed. Astro's Playroom, I think is what it's called. Really awesome if you haven't finished that. They made that as well, and they haven't made anything since then. So it would make sense for a new Astrobot game to come out. I hope it's another rescue mission game for PlayStation VR 2, because Astrobot <laughs> Astrobot's rescue mission for the original PlayStation VR is amazing. Uh, but it does seem like Sony's kind of stepping away from PlayStation VR 2 for a few reasons that we'll talk about later. And so my guess is that game wouldn't be VR only, but we'll see. And then Sony Bend, they haven't released a game since Days Gone, which I think came out in 2019. Um, So it seems like they would probably be ready to show something as well. Um, So we'll see. We'll see what uh, is announced next week. And maybe those uh, three predictions from David will be terrible ones, but uh, we won't know until next week. Um, anything that you would love to see at the state of play tomorrow, Devin? Uh, I'd like to see Starfield come to PlayStation tomorrow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Just a <laughs> shadow drop. It's out today. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's out today. Yes, please. Yeah. No, I honestly have no idea. You are the news expert and I don't know too much about the news side of this. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, yeah, I guess the one other thing that I would be incredibly happy about and would change the order in which I play everything in the near future is if Silk Song was at this event. Oh, yes, please. The Silk Song has traditionally been shown at Nintendo's stuff, so it might be at Nintendo's conference in June, but you know, who knows? They, it seemed like Nintendo kind of had a deal with them. But then like a year later, they announced, yeah, it's also coming to Xbox day and day. And then like six months later, they announced, oh, yeah, it's also coming to PlayStation day and day. So I don't know where it will be. It could be anywhere or it could be nowhere. It could not exist at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If a silk song is shown tomorrow, 
I'll be very happy. All right, that was number one. So we've got the state of play coming up or already happened for those listening. Next up, every month, this company called Circana, they used to have a different name that is uh, escaping me at the moment, but it's this like uh, analyst firm. They put together data on the video game industry and how well like the companies do, are doing and which games are selling the best. And it's always kind of interesting to me as you know, I'm a data analyst, so I, I like this kind of stuff. So they announce a lot of stuff, but I'm, I've only listed two things here. So the best selling games of the month for April, 2024, and they list the top 20. I'm going to read them really quick and then we can talk about anything that kind of stands out to you. So number one is stellar blade. Number two, hell divers two, then Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, Sea of Thieves, Fallout 4, MLB The Show, Dragon's Dogma 2, Fallout 76, Hogwarts Legacy, EA Sports Football Club 24, Rise of the Ronin, Grounded, Minecraft, Madden, NFL 24, Princess Peach Showtime, and that's got an asterisk next to it because Nintendo does not include digital sales in their data they report to Circana, so that's only from physical Switch cartridges. Um, then Rainbow Six Siege, Tekken 8, Mario Kart 8 again, not including digital, Elden Ring, and Marvel's Spider-Man 2. So those were the 20 best-selling games for the month of April. Stellar Blade making a big splash there at number one, which is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of surprising, but at the same time, not. I would say I'm surprised, I mean, yes. I am a bit too, because it's uh, it's only on PlayStation 5. I don't even think it's on PC. Um. So that, that's a lot of units to sell just on one platform. Yeah, and I think a lot of people played the demo. And, like, I played the demo. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dang, this actually feels pretty good. But I didn't think it was, like, groundbreaking so good. I was so excited to get it. I never actually even paid attention yeah. to when the actual release date was. I think I know why people are playing that game. We don't need to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, they're adding a photo mode for that oh, reason. Oh boy! The future, so we know exactly why you're playing Stellar Blade out there, folks. Just what the game didn't need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a game where the demo helped it quite a bit. Yeah, because there there are some times where a demo doesn't help. You know, people are like, Ew. <laughs> but I think that did give it a lot of buzz. A lot of people were streaming that demo. You streamed the demo. Yeah, and. I think it yeah just kind of generated a lot of buzz and it's Sony's you know only like exclusive game in quite a while since Helldivers and so just had quite a big splash I'm kind of surprised Helldivers 2 being at number 2 is still crazy since that came out you know 3 months ago um so it's just uh just crazy the other on on this list they list what rank the game was last month and I think that's really interesting too so you can see like Sea of Thieves was number four this month, but it was number 55 last month. That PlayStation version selling a ton. Fallout 4 was number 87. Fallout 76 was number 159. It's number eight. Well, and my the concern there is the game seems like it's free in so many places. So why are we purchasing it? You know yeah, I mean? that's a good question. Yeah, I think it is free on a lot of subscription services but that's not included here this is sales um so a lot of people are buying it too so people that don't have game pass or people that don't have playstation plus watch the tv show and they're like frick i want to buy this um that's cool yeah tons of tons of sales for fallout yeah and then grounded as well at number 167 last month so all of those ones I just mentioned, Sea of Thieves, Fallout 4, Fallout 76, and Grounded are Microsoft games, either from Bethesda or from one of Microsoft's other teams. And Grounded and Sea of Thieves just came to PlayStation. So getting big bumps from coming out on, on Sony's platform, for sure. And then Nintendo is just funny. <laughs> They're, uh, they sell so much, and they don't even report their digital sales because they're just like, Circana, you can't handle how many games we're selling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though like Princess Peach isn't at number one and Mario Kart 8 isn't like, you know, near the top, but so many, and that doesn't even include digital. It's nuts. 
they do include a list of the top 10 best-selling games by platform. So like so PlayStation's top 10, Xbox's top 10, and Nintendo's top 10. On Nintendo's, eight of the top 10 games are Nintendo games. One of them's Minecraft, and the other one was Hogwarts Legacy. And then every other game is either Zelda, Mario, or the Princess Peach game or whatever. And so they just sell, they sell so many freaking copies of their own games over there. It's nuts. What I think we talked about last week, like Mario Kart 8 has like (laughs) sold like 65 million copies or something. It's nuts. They sell so much. All right. The other thing I wanted to just go through the top selling games of the entire year. So this is from January through the end of April. Plus or minus a couple of days, but number one, Helldivers 2, best selling game of the year. Still is, it was last month as well. Number two is last year's Call of Duty, <laughs> just to show how much of a behemoth Call of Duty is. Um, then Dragon's Dogma 2, MLB The Show 24, Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Tekken 8, Madden 24, Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, Hogwarts Legacy, Persona 3 Reload, EA Sports FC 24, NBA 2K 24, Marvel Spider Man 2. Rise of the Ronin, Skull and Bones, Stellar Blade, already the 16th best-selling game of the year after just one month. Uh, Minecraft, Sea of Thieves, again getting a big boost from spot 42 to spot 18 based on that PlayStation version. Elden Ring and Super Mario Bros. Wonder, which is such a good game. Um, Yeah, Helldivers, man. So selling like crazy. I think they announced last week, was it like 8 million already or something? I mean, so many. it had to have exceeded their expectation of how well that game would do. Oh, Tremendously. By like a magnitude of like 10, I don't know. Oh yeah, they're having dance parties every night. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I hope the people over at the, now I can't remember the name of the company that makes Helldivers, I hope they all made a lot of money. All right, so that was the Circana reports. If you like that kind of stuff, that the guy at Circana, I think his name is Matt Piscatella. He like releases a Twitter thread with all of this data and like 20 images of all of their data and then he also like reply tweets to that post like this is what we learned about this. This is what we learned about this. Blah 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 blah. blah. Um very interesting stuff. All right. Next one Sony has their annual days of play sale every like summer. I think they're usually around the beginning of June and just a couple of days ago this year's started. So there's a few things included. The first one is there's a big sale on PSN with over 500 games discounted. Lots of big games. I'm going to read a few names here, but there were a lot more. I didn't scroll through all of it, even though I will finish through scrolling through the rest of the, list before I decide if I'm going to buy anything. Yeah, Spider-Man 2, Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, Rise of the Ronin, so Rise of the Ronin and Rebirth just barely came out. God of War Ragnarok, Last of Us Part 2, Fallout, Hogwarts Legacy, the new Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora game, Alan Wake 2, Liza P, Diablo 4, all of those were on sale and lots of other big name games. So check that sale out on the PlayStation Store. The next thing, they also have sales on PlayStation Direct and sometimes Amazon and other retailers match these uh, discounts. So you might see these prices other places too. You can get $50 off a of PlayStation 5. So that's $400 for a digital one or $450 for a disc. I still think Costco's bundles beat that price sometimes because they usually come with like, here's a game and an extra controller. Wow. Costco is just the best for that kind of stuff. Um. You can get $100 off a PlayStation VR 2 or a VR 2 bundle. So the base bundle would be $450 instead of $550. $15 off DualSense controllers and $10 off, what are they called? The covers. So you can change the color of your PlayStation with like the red and blue covers. You can also get 30% off PlayStation Plus if you're a new subscriber. They don't like us that have subscribed for years. And if you upgrade from essential to extra, you can get a $25, not dollar, 25% discount on that upgrade. If you upgrade to premium, you can get a 30% discount on that uh, upgrade. Really kind of a bummer that, you know, people like me who have been subscribed forever, 
I'm on the premium tier. Like, why not give us a discount? <laughs> it's like cell phone pre- plans. It's like internet and cell phone plans. Exactly. It is. Yeah. Frustrating stuff. Very dumb. I don't use all the premium like perks either so i might downgrade to extra this next year we'll see but anyway so there's those discounts as well then they have some bonus games that are coming to their different playstation plus services so there's four bonus games coming to playstation plus extra the first one is dredge and it's out right now from may 29th game is really cool has a movie based about it a board game inspired by it so it's a it's i already mentioned the movie right yeah movie it's a really cool fishing game kind of a creepy vibe lego marvel superheroes 2 from may 31st cricket 24 if you uh live in europe or have watched the cricket episode of bluey you know which is the only item cricket related i have ever seen in my life is the bluey episode and in the teenage mutant ninja turtles movie I think Casey Jones pulls out a cricket bat to hit Raphael in the face. Those are the only two cricket things I've ever seen. You ever seen cricket? Uh, I think, was there a cricket in Pinocchio? (laughs) Yeah, there was. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. We don't know anything about cricket in America. That cricket 24. You were talking about the sport. (laughs) The sport. (laughs) See, we don't even know if it's a sport or an insect. (laughs) <laughs> sorry i was like zoning for a second that's uh. <laughs> yeah, all good oh, man so that if you like cricket that game will be on extra on june 5th and then on june 7th grand theft auto san andreas definitive edition then some bonus games coming to the premium tier of playstation plus this first segment is really cool it seems they have a new playstation 2 emulator that they're going to be releasing releasing games for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 through this PS2 emulator, which is cool because it hopefully signals that we know they've been working on this initiative for a while, but hopefully a PlayStation 3 emulator will one day before I die finally come to these platforms so that I don't have to stream PlayStation 3 games, but I can actually download them and play them directly on the console. That would be like... The best thing ever since the playstation 3 had such an awesome library of games i have so many of them but i don't want to go get that thing downstairs and plug it in i don't know anyways that's not what we're talking about right now playstation 2 emulator (laughs) there's three games i really hope the emulator is solid you know runs the games well and i really hope these games have trophies that would be cool they have added trophies to a lot of the games like the ape escape for example version that came out a few months ago it had trophies and so i hope they add them here too some cool games the first one is the one i'm most excited for sly cooper and the thievius raccoonus is out on june 11th i really love sly cooper i've played sly cooper one part of two and then i've played sly cooper four which is awesome they're like uh, yeah super awesome games they were made by sucker punch i believe who makes ghost of tsushima and you can at least the first three were and you can kind of tell because it kind of has the same like uh, stealth vibes for sure and you can see the progression from like sly cooper to infamous and then to ghost of tsushima anyway sly cooper is really great um kind of has a kids game aesthetic you know ratchet and clank kind of vibes really great next one is tomb raider legend i don't know a lot about this game but tomb raider they were always a fun time and then Star Wars, The Clone Wars. All three of those on June 11th. All right. Next, there's some bonus PSVR 2 games. It looks like all of these on June 6th. There's five of them. Ghostbusters, Rise of the Ghost Lord, Walkabout Mini Golf, Synth Riders, Before Your Eyes, and The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, Chapters 1 and 2. I think that Saints and Sinners game is supposed to be pretty solid and Before Your Eyes and Synth Riders as well. So if you have a PlayStation VR 2 and haven't already purchased those, <laughs> um, you got some cool new games to play as of June 6th. I would love to get a PlayStation VR 2. <sighs> but, uh, you know, money is money. 
And even with a hundred dollar discount, four hundred and fifty bucks is still a lot of those dineros. Yeah, that's more than the console. Yeah, it really is. All right, Devin, any of those uh, bonus games or discounts or PSN sale games that uh, uh, pop out to you? I know I mentioned Liza P is on sale. I know that's a that's a hit for Devin. Oh, one of my favorite games. So good. Um, Which Fallout was it? I think they had uh, sales on 476 and 4's expansion content. I see, I see. Um, I would like to try Alan Wake 2. I think I would enjoy that game. Well. It's supposed to be way scarier than the first one. I hope so. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that is the Days of Play sale event going on. So if you've wanted to get a new PlayStation, you can get a discount. PlayStation VR discount, DualSense, console covers, PlayStation Plus, if you're upgrading, discount. So cool stuff, unless you're somebody that already has a PlayStation and already has PlayStation Plus, then Sony gives you, you know, the middle finger and says, no discount for you. And (laughs) here we are. All right, next up, talking about PlayStation VR 2, Sony has submitted a certification in Korea or an adapter for PlayStation VR 2 to work on PC. They mentioned this initiative a few months ago. It might have been on an earnings call that they want to get PlayStation VR 2 working on PC, which would be very cool because then I can, not just me, but we can use that on Steam. You know, play, what's the Half-Life, excuse me, Half-Life Alex is a Steam exclusive, I believe, that is supposed to be one of the best VR games ever made. So it would be really cool to play all the great PlayStation VR games, but then play all the VR games that are on PC as well. I really hope they can get that adapter, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. That would be cool. You know, knowing uh, Sony right now that wants all the profit and doesn't have like a very strong Microsoft competitor at the moment, they might be like, oh yeah, you want an adapter? How's 99.99 sound? Oh, yeah. I'm be like, oh, yeah, it sounds about as good as my PS Plus discount, yo. <laughs> but anyways, that's a cool initiative. I'm excited for that to come to a PC. Next up, Gran Turismo 7 is having an update on May 29th. So that's today, actually. So that was today. It's going to add five new cars, some new races and events and more. The five cars are Honda Civic SIR 2. EG 1993. I don't know what a lot of those acronyms mean, but you got a fancy Honda Civic from 1993. Got a Honda NSX GT500 from 2000. A Nissan Skyline GTS R R31 from 1987. And a Volvo 240SE Estate 93. And a Volvo V40 T5 R Design 2013. I do like the Skylines. Those are cool. That is a good looking car and they should remake that. Yeah. That'd be sweet. This one from 1987 though. That's before I was born. Yeah, I don't, I know don't what really that know what that looks that, like. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to look that up. But yeah, they are very uh, faithful with their car redesign. So they like choose, oh, we're not just remaking the Skyline. We're remaking the R31 version of the Skyline GTS-R and specifically the 1987 version. <laughs> Uh, a little nuts, but for people that love Gran Turismo, they are continuing to release those free car packs. So that's cool. All righty. Next two are just quick updates. It seems like a couple games that have launched recently are um, off to pretty strong starts. Multiversus, we just talked about, just came out. And it has over 110,000 Steam concurrents, um, I think, in this last week, which is a pretty high number. And that only counts Steam. That doesn't count the players on PlayStation and Xbox. I don't know if that game's on Switch. I would imagine they probably tried to put it there. So So there's probably, I mean, I don't know if I'd say double that, but maybe double that many people playing it, which is a a pretty big number. So they might be pretty happy with that. Not 100% sure, but it seems strong. And then the next one, X Defiant, is Ubisoft's like biggest Tom's Clancy, free-to-play first-person shooter and the number that they've announced 
is 8 million unique players, which is a little misleading because a unique player could be somebody that like downloaded the game, hit like try tutorial and then played for 30 seconds, you know, but uh, that is a big number regardless. So I know that game might be off to a bigger start than I thought too. Free to play games, man. They have a big reach and you, if as long as the game looks half decent, it seems like you can get people in the door you know, to download the game or try it out. Can you keep them? Can you get them to pay money? Those are probably the two tricky parts. So anyways, those two games seem like they're doing pretty well. Last bit of news. This is in our movie and game, not game show, (laughs) movie and TV show segment. And this is the only item in that segment today. In The Last of Us Part 2, there was a character named Isaac. He is the leader of of the Washington Liberation Front, which they call the Wolves in the game. Uh, Cool little uh, tidbit here. The same actor who played him in the game is going to be playing him in the show. So he'll look and sound exactly the same. I like it when they're able to do that. Yeah, Um, They didn't do it for Joel and Ellie, but they did throw, you know, Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson who play Joel and Ellie in the video game, they put both of them in the TV show as other characters, Ellie's mom. And I can't remember who Troy Baker was. He was a character in one of the cities, but so really awesome that they're, uh, you know, giving those actors kind of some, uh, some more work and letting it stay true to the, the character that they played in the show. Really excited for that show. I really hope it launches in like January or February and not like October of next year yeah that game and show are so great i'm excited to see how they handle it too because this game is way more like intense than the first one as far as like crazy twists and turns and story moments and like oh my gosh i don't know if i can watch this (laughs) and so we'll see how they handle it there's a lot of things a lot of people are thinking that i don't want to spoil like anything that they're going to change the timeline so that certain events don't happen when they did in the show. Um, or there's kind of the Abby Ellie structure at the end of the game where they do like three days with Ellie and then three days with Abby, I believe is the structure. And during that segment and that they might just instead like intertwine their stories day after day or something. So lots that they can do there because they were so uh, kind of creative with the timeline last time. I wouldn't mind if they stayed exactly how it was because it hit pretty hard so really excited for that show all right that is all the news Devin. we uh we did it i think that's uh that's a wrap any other uh board game or video game things you want to talk about before i throw my last closing question at you um supercell released their new game today oh i saw That's an ad for that busters you- i played the tutorial for about five minutes realized it would never be as good as uh, clash royale and turned the game off <laughs> it looks a lot like the other clash royale game in my opinion brawl the stars one that are- yeah brawl stars is that what it played like or did it play different the art style is very similar the movement style seemed similar but i i tried it for three minutes so i'm unsure yeah. it seemed like a shooter kind of game with special abilities like that though right where you're moving your character in a squad of two or three and like trying to do damage to the enemies is that yeah right? like collecting chests or cutting down trees mm. i don't really know it was, i don't know it's crazy our younger brother was saying that brawl stars is like huge in his high school right now and i'm like really people playing this game on your phone where you have to play it with touch controls yeah like that seems awful <laughs> <laughs> but this might be old man yells at cloud a little bit here, but it is cool that you can like connect a, a PlayStation five controller to iOS devices now. So hopefully you can play those with an actual controller. Cause I think I would jump off a bridge if I had to play that with my thumbs on the screen. Um, it's probably not as bad as I just made it sound, but that was me being a little hyperbolic. All right. Well, that was a good shout out though, Devin. That's a, uh, yeah, I did see an ad for that today, and I was like, oh, I wonder when that comes out. So, look at you, all up to date on the Supercell. Oh, yeah. All right, last question of the day. Today, we're just going to do one question, since it's kind of been a long episode, to be honest. I didn't think yeah. it would be, but here we are. 
question of the day. What is your favorite game or the best games that you've played that you did not think you would like? This is a tricky one. Especially for someone that is crazy like me because I do so much freaking research before I buy a video game or buy a board game. Probably because I'm not like a billionaire. And so like when I see $70, I'm like, oh, frick, if I'm going to spend that, I got to make sure first. <laughs> or a board game, you know, it's 50 bucks plus shipping or whatever. I'm like, ah, I got to make sure first. And so I'll watch videos and stuff. And so I don't play a game or buy any games often that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to like this. <laughs> so a little tricky, but I have a few answers for this question. Um, and I can start if you would like, or if you've got a couple you want to start with, we can just kind of hop back and forth again. So you tell me who you want to start today. Um, I'll start. Let's see. Cool. Um, how many answers you got? You want me to read multiple off or just one at a time? I've got six, <laughs> but I've got five. We don't have to do. Oh, nice. Well, maybe I'll start then. Yeah. And then, uh, we'll just alternate. Okay. My first one is a video game. <clears throat> I I struggle with turn-based video games and sometimes I struggle with games that are, I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't sound like racist. <laughs> I don't mean it racist in any way at all, but games that are too Japanese. Uh. Um, and I think people know what I mean, right? Um, Stellar blade kind of comes to mind for like a naked in Japanese way. I just mean Japanese in this, this setting. <laughs> um, <laughs> As, <laughs> there's this in recent years though i've started to turn around to liking some japanese um entertainment and you know i've repented of my ways i should have liked it earlier probably but i really like you know studio ghibli movies really well done anime i've mentioned a couple times on the show i really like attack on titan um and i'm sure there are other anime i would like but they are so long and such a time sink i don't let myself get too I'll only try them rarely because I'm nervous. It'll take over my whole life. Anyways, that was a little bit of a <clears throat> preamble to the fact that I was a little nervous to try this game called Nino Kuni. Nino Kuni is basically, I don't know how to explain it. I think that Studio Ghibli did the art for this game. So it's very pretty. And if you took that and put like an emotional story in it about a boy who's spoiler for the first 30 minutes whose mom dies and he's really sad about it and then mixed in like Pokemon and you have to capture creatures and then go on this big journey to try and save your mom. And there's a witch involved and all kinds of magical stuff. So it kind of has like spirited away vibes where like, Oh, I'm meeting a weird character and then I'm going to meet a witch and you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. So I don't like turn-based games. I, I've, I had struggled with Japanese stuff, but man, Nino Kuni rules. Super awesome. It's turn-based, but not fully. You get to move your character around this like little circle space and then decide which of your little Pokemon type creatures you're going to have out fighting at the moment. So you'll like set him out and then, Tell him, okay, go do this attack. And you're running around collecting stuff. So you're controlling your character the whole time with the stick. So there's a lot of like active stuff going on. It's not just I tell him to do tail whip and he goes over there and does it. And then you're upgrading those creatures. And there's like 150 different ones in the game that you can catch and tame. And then you have to feed them like candies and stuff to teach them new moves and stuff. And then the story, I didn't get like super deep into like, I'm going to make the best nino kuni creature builds in the world i was mainly playing it for this is like fun and the story is really cute and well done and so i you know i didn't like 100 percent it but i did finish it very very good loved it and yeah highly recommend that if you like studio ghibli stuff like that and are looking for an rpg game that you can probably beat in 40 hours but if you want 100 percent, it'll probably take you 80 it's really cool it even uh, after I played that one, I was so into it. I played number two, like started it the next day. And it is also awesome. It's quite a bit different. There's no like creature taming and it's a lot less turn based. So it's like I have a sword and I'm smacking stuff. So it's a lot more action based, actually. And 
still awesome art, really cool story about like this. <laughs> and as I say this, it's going to sound dorky, but this uh, clan of rats takes over your city and you're the prince and they like kill the king and throw you out of the city. And so you have to like run away and then try to fight your way back to, you know, get your throne back and you build up like this kingdom, man, Nino Kuni wanted to rule. <laughs> They're so good. So if you haven't played like a, either of those and are looking for a good JRPG, even if you don't like turn-based games, even if you've been turned off by Japanese stuff before, very solid. Highly recommend. And Nino Kuni one has been remastered. So it's on PlayStation four now instead of PlayStation three runs great. And then Nino Kuni two always was. So that was my number one. That was a long one, Devin. Yeah. I played one or two of those as well. It was fun. The art style was cool. I hardly remember it, but I know I played it. I don't know. Uh, I, just I was remember, gonna say i just remember running around for a that, bit that's cool and i remember the combat and all that yeah love that game um speaking of characters whose families just died and it was sad <laughs> and this answer probably fits the description of the question the best for me um out of any of my answers as far as what games i thought i would hate that i ended up loving my number one is going to be what remains of edith finch Oh, great one. Um, what a strange game. It's such a unique game that I never thought I would dabble in at all. Like, there's no action. It's basically just storytelling, secrets about your learning about your ancestors or something. And you do the most strange things in that game. It's like, here, just sit on this, sit on this rope swing and enjoy this view and this music. Or why don't you should cut cut dead fish for a while and yep. just really really random tasks but it just a, ends up being a beautiful story i think people have hinted at the main character what was like being pregnant mm. or something the whole game there's like all the i don't know the, mm. i don't know super deep yeah, story a... and beautiful really i really love that game too <clears throat> that genre of game sometimes gets called walking simulator because you kind of just like walk around to different rooms and maybe solve some light puzzles and you're reading story segments. And a lot of people say that in like a negative way, like, Oh, this game's dumb. It's just a walking simulator. But I, th I think what remains of Edith Finch is probably the first one of those that I ever really liked too. And after playing that one, I've played a couple more Tacoma is one I played recently. That's in a space station. So it's like in space, some zero gravity segments as well. Also very good. So I'm very picky with that sort of game. The story has to be killer. Uh, and what remains of Edith Finch is a little odd and like halfway creepy at some parts. And I think the whole point of the game is you are that family has like a curse, they think, and all of like, like a lot of the family members keep dying. And so you're like reliving the deaths of those family members. So that girl on the swing fell off the swing into the water and, the little boy playing in the tub with his toys <laughs> drown in the tub. <laughs> oh, so it's like, <laughs> see, I don't, I so don't know little, this stuff. I don't pay attention <laughs> well enough. That part's a little morbid, but it's presented in such like a cheery and good way. And like the, the story seems to have like a good ending where she thinks she's broken this like family curse, I think. So very cool game. Really recommend that one. I hope I didn't just spoil too much of it, but even by me saying those few little bits, it's really playing through it and like hearing the music and experiencing the, the walking sim part of it. That is the vibe. So great choice, Devin. All right. Uh, my next one, I'm going to do a board game next. This board game back when I didn't have as many board games as I do now, I used to, I'd get an email from this board game shop called miniature market. And sometimes they have these crazy freaking sales. Like we need to clear you know, clearance sale, this stuff must go. This game is $2. This game's $3 for like a $30 game or whatever. So sometimes I would just buy like dozens of games for like a hundred bucks or whatever. I barely get to that free shipping threshold. And I'm like, man, I got 25 games for a hundred bucks. That's like a freaking steal. Um, a lot of them, not so hot. Had to get rid of a lot of them. This one, I did not think I was going to like out of the stack of them, but it was $3, and I was like, my kid's going to like this game, so that's fine. 
It is called Yum Yum Island. <laughs> kind of a dorky name. You play as these different birds. Kind of remind me of that bird from uh, The Rescuers, the sequel that they write on. And you're flying over this island, trying to drop food down to these animals because this giant has come and eaten all their food. They don't have any food. Very simple game. You can play in like, what does it say on the box here? 20 minutes, ages six plus. You can play it younger than that, I have. Uh, two to five players. Basically, you all sit around this island board, and there's all these animal pieces that you put out. And the animals are double layered because they all have their mouths open, pointed up. And so their mouth is like a recessed area. On your turn, you're going to pick up a bunch of different food pieces that are either green to show like vegetables, I think, and pink to show meat. But before you pick those up, you're going to take the little launch pad that this bird is supposedly like jumping off of to drop this food down to the animals and point it where you want to go. There's kind of this pointer on the end. And then you put on a blindfold. And with the blindfold on, you can feel the edge of that board to the pointer to know, okay, that's the direction I knew the animal was in. And then you have to grab some food with one hand off of that little spot and then move your hand forward, whatever you think the right amount is, and then drop it, hoping to get the food in that animal's mouth. Any food you don't get in the animal's mouth goes in the giant's mouth. And if the giant gets too full, it means he ate too much of the food and you lose. Before you take your turn, you roll this die that determines if the other players can talk to you or not. Usually they can. So after you pick up some stuff and start to move your hand, they'll tell you like, okay, go forward a little bit more or go down a little bit more. Um, so they can help you move like left and right, which is a little tricky with kids because you tell them left and they move their hand right, but still fun. Um, and very simple to play that way. You're just dropping stuff and hoping it lands in the animal's mouth. It becomes a little trickier because if you if you bump anything with your hands, then you have to drop the food immediately and you don't get to move your hand anymore. And there are four trees like standing up in the play space. You have to be really careful about where you put your hands and you're just trying to drop this food. Very simple, like obviously not the most complex or deep game in the world, but for 15 minutes of fun, I imagine this would pair well with, um, you know, adult beverages that I don't, you know, condone, <laughs> but also <laughs> pairs really well with a family game night, you know, to just have some fun with your kids, laugh and drop some stuff, put some fun blindfolds on. So if you can find Yum Yum Island on a sale like that, I think it's, it's a it's a hit with kids. So that was my next one. Yeah, I've never seen that game. It looks funny. <laughs> my number yeah. two is I'll just do my other walking simulator. I chose uh, it's a game called Firewatch. Um, mm, yeah, I thought I'd hate that game and I. I don't hardly remember, but I do remember I was like, dang, I honestly enjoyed that. I think you have like a walkie talkie. There's like some watchtowers. You're in the forest. I think it's mm -hmm. like a loneliness simulator. Kind of game. Do you know much about it? Yeah, I've played it. Oh, okay. I really liked it too. The art style especially has like that funky like Pixar looking vibe. Um, and yeah, really fun. I thought the story was awesome and I was really digging the entire game. But I did not like how it ended. Um, mm, I and I think remember. that was maybe the maybe the point of the game was that it didn't end in the way that like I think it was kind of building towards and everyone wanted to because you're talking to this woman mm -hmm. who's in a different tower over the walkie talkies and you're kind of building this relationship with her it seems like and and I won't spoil it but yeah very fun you like have to go out from your fire tower to like stop some kids from like vandalizing and you if you explore enough you can find these like funny turtles like scattered around and stuff but very much a story game where you're walking a lot doing some little things along the way opening some little puzzles, but yeah, talking to that other character through the walkie talkie is the majority of it. Yeah. really like that one again. Wish it ended differently just for like the, I don't know the person in me that likes like the clean, perfect ending where everything works together for the person, but that's not how that game ends <laughs> as like a mild spoiler. You come to the super game brothers podcast to get everything spoiled. So there you go. Um, cool. That's a good one though. 
Good choice. My next one for a video game is a Metroidvania game called Cathedral. And it has very pixely art, kind of Castlevania vibes. You play this this knight character. And again, I got it on like a sale for super cheap. And I was like, I'm just really wanting a Metroidvania. And there's not like a super one out right now. Um, I see the super indie one. I'm going to try it. And man, 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 man. So good. It's, it's probably like my third or fourth favorite one ever that I've played. Music just like slaps. Um, it's a little simpler than like Hollow Knight and Ender Lilies that I talked about last week. But man, it's difficult. Some tough boss fights and some really tough platforming segments. And the map is like freaking huge. Like so much more game there than I thought there was going to be. That game... I played it on PlayStation. I think it's also on the Evercade, which is this really cool like handheld thing that you can buy cartridge packs for that has like retro indie games on it. So it it's not a ton of places, but I think it's on Steam, it's on PlayStation, and I think it's on the Evercade, which is kind of uh kind of cool for it to be there. So check out Cathedral if you need a Metroidvania game to play. I think it's a uh, you know it's not like super innovative or anything but it's very solid for what it is okay my third one is unique it doesn't really fit the mold perfectly of the question we asked but uh super mario kart owned this genre for a long time and i'm sure i was excited to play this game but i am gonna pick crash team racing uh just once you've played mario kart you're like no, no other racing games that are like this are going to be as good, but Crash Team Racing was so freaking goaded, and we got so yeah. sucked into the game, and the powers were cool. It was just different than Mario Kart's. We ended up replaying the game so much. We tried to do the time trials. We found all the shortcuts in the levels, and just a different feel. The drifting's different, and the characters from very nostalgic Crash Bandicoot games growing up are amazing. You can play as a tiny baby uh, polar bear, which is amazing. Yeah, that one, that one is great. I, yeah, it's tough. I, you think about like, what's the best kart racer like ever? It's probably hard to beat Mario Kart eight just because it's got like a hundred levels and it's been refined for like a decade. But as far as like one that was made by a team in like, nine to 12 months or however much time naughty dog had and it's a genre that they don't usually make crash team racing is like super 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 great that drifting is really unique you have to like you hold one of the triggers and then have to tap the other one on these intervals as you're drifting to get like little boosts you have to watch this little like boost meter and try to hit it at the right moment to get the most uh, speed out of it so yeah, it's a little bit more involved and difficult, I would say. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't know if your character moves faster than in like Mario Kart, but it feels like the racing feels faster in my opinion. Uh super great. The remake is also really really good. Um on PlayStation 4. Super good. Love that. Uh my next two I've talked about on the show before. This one I've talked about on this very show and I think I've shown it twice on this episode. Sand I don't generally like pick up and deliver games. I bought this one that I thought I was going to love is a post-apocalyptic pick up and deliver game kind of with a very similar to Mad Max vibe. It was called wasteland express delivery service, I believe. And man, that one just did not vibe or click with me like at all, but sand is, and as I've started to like figure out what my board gaming tastes are, sand is a Euro game, Euro game where you're trying to, be efficient, convert resources. It's a puzzle and man, sand's just great. It's definitely the first pickup and deliver game I've ever loved. And I was really nervous because I was like, ah, do I even buy this game? Because like, it looks great. And I like Devere's other couple games I've played, but I have never liked one of these. Um, so I was, I was really nervous to even buy it, but super glad I did sand rules. That's all I'll say about that. Since I've talked about <laughs> sand a lot. All right, my number four is Luigi's Mansion. Thought I'd hate that game. I really did. I was like, I'm not going to enjoy this game. 
The game was so fun. There's so much going on. You have a vacuum and there's explosions and different mechanics to like pull curtains off walls and find extra little secrets and keys to get through gates. And I don't remember too much about the game, but I remember I was like, dang, I actually really enjoyed this game. And I love horror things and it's a very cartoon, scary, spooky game. And so, yeah, Luigi's Mansion sits at number four for me. Yeah, good choice. I love that one, too. Which one did you play? Did you play the third one? There's more than on one stream, maybe. Yeah, the first one was on GameCube. Second one. Can't remember. Might have been on 3DS. Oh, no, I, I played the most recent then. <laughs> OK, you played the Switch one. The uh, Luigi's Mansion 3. OK, that one is cool. My kids. I mean, I I probably got two thirds done with that game and I, I didn't finish it. Man, my kids really love that game. And it is surprisingly long. Mm. Like, I think. I mean, unless you like super mainline it and don't get lost, like my kids get lost a bunch and try to find every little thing. But I think there's basically a boss on every floor of this hotel. And each time you beat the boss, you get the next elevator button number that takes you to the next floor. And I think there's 15 floors. Wow. So, yeah, that, that game is really great. Really great. Again, if you like puzzles, not too much combat, but the the way that you like, you know, suck up the uh, ghosts into the vacuum is fun. And each boss is like its own little unique puzzle. Very, very good choice. Love that. All right. My last video game of this uh, list is another game that I uh, I didn't know if I would like. Again, just kind of going back to that Japanese theme where I'm I had been picky with those and hadn't found a ton of them that I loved. And then I generally like action in my video games. And so reading a lot of text is not usually my favorite thing. And so visual novels, I haven't really jived with sometimes, but I tried Phoenix Wright out last year uh, in its like remastered collection, which contains the first three Phoenix Wright games, I think. And man, so fun. Basically, you play as this attorney I don't even remember if you were a, an attorney or if you were just somebody there that, that was there that day and they pulled you into the office. But you play as an attorney and you have to solve all of these cases. I think each game has five cases in it. And in a case, there's usually like a murder or something stolen or something. And you have to go to different locations, interrogate people for evidence. And then the big kind of climax of each case is you go to the courtroom for the trial and then you have to present evidence. You have to like call witnesses to the stand and then ask them questions. And then the, what's it called? The other attorney, it would be the defense of the generally of the person up there is like trying to also question them and like get your evidence to contradict itself. Um, and so you're trying to win the case by getting your client you know, either off the hook or whatever and find the truth of what really happened in these cases. And yeah, super, super fun. They're the only thing I would say that I didn't love about this game is it really is a visual novel and it leans into it hard. And so sometimes there's a lot to read. Um, like I think each case is probably like four hours long, you know, probably give or take. You're doing quite a bit. Usually you're like traveling to different locations, talking to a bunch of people. Then you travel to different, travel to a different place, find more evidence, then go back and talk to somebody else. And they know something new now that you got the other evidence. Um, and so it can be a little long and you're like menu hopping a lot to like get to the different locations and stuff. So again, it kind of shows its age a little bit that way with the menus and like quality of life stuff, not being perfect, but super fun. Just like a fun courtroom drama with a, some anime vibes and uh, there's kind of like this little love story ish between like the, a couple of the people and it's a fun time. So that is Phoenix, Wright. That is like the collection as the first three games. And they just released another collection. I think Chronicles that has a different three games. There's like a ton of Phoenix, Wright If you like that kind of thing. So check those out. Interesting. Okay, last one for me. All of mine are always video games because it's all I know. So um, <laughs> it's all good. this falls in the uh, sport category. I never play sports games, ever. 
and this might have just come in a bundle with our Nintendo, but Wii Sports. Did not think I would enjoy that game, and man, we put a lot of time at least into the bowling portion of that video game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had the like... wrist movements with the Wii Motes. We knew exactly what we were doing. Yeah, you could crank some crazy spin on that bad boy. I feel like uh, we had different months where, like, bowling was kind of the staple. That was, like, the always go back to. But then I have, like, a few weeks where, like, okay, now I'm really into the golf for whatever reason. And, like, how can I get better at golf? And then, like, okay, I'm going to get really good at this boxing one. Like, the boxing right. was pretty fun. <laughs> um so i don't know and like the tennis one was probably the most simple i don't know the one that we probably got into the least what other ones were there i feel like i'm missing one know. volleyball there was golf i think there was volleyball in the wii sports resort oh like the like expansion pack game but i don't think volleyball was in the original what what did we name we named golf tennis bowling um i named another one didn't i golf tennis bowling and boxing i feel like there was one more uh baseball baseball okay yeah and the baseball one was pretty fun to be honest yeah those are good that is uh one of the best-selling games of all time mainly because it was a bundle with the wii right and probably sold with the tons of retirement homes and stuff i feel like that was kind of a old person thing like let's stay young and do the wee bowling forever you know i feel like that was a, a vibe for sure good one though we did play that a ton mm -hmm. for being like a demo disc kind of thing packed in there all right my last one again i've talked about this on the show i got this game for 10 bucks on a clearance sale at target I mainly bought it because I had heard the book series was good and I love Stonemaier games. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a whole shelf up here with their games and um, I think they do a great job. This is a Red Rising and it gets kind of a bad rap. And I think it would have got a better rap if it came in a box half this big because I think it could fit in a box half this big and was billed more as like, this is a fun card game as opposed to this is a full-sized big box board game because it really is just a card game at heart where you are trying to exchange cards in your hand for cards that are on the main display and at the end of the game have the best combo of cards in your hand and whoever has a hand worth the most points wins basically very fun though i think it gets a, a bad rap but it is a very fun game it has a really solid solo mode too so like i mentioned i've talked about it before so i won't spend any more time on it but red rising is very solid and one that you can pretty often find for a good deal you know sub 20 bucks so cool we had more of those than i thought we would that was uh, 11 solid uh, game recommendations there <laughs> love it i'm gonna uh you're gonna have to write yours in there so i can remember what we even said there were so many but all right well this is pro probably gonna be our longest episode somehow i don't know what the heck we talked about but there were some words and now there's going to be no more words because the show is about to end. But Devin, thanks for being here with me today. I know you've got a early bedtime, so I'm going to get you out of here so you can get to bed, play some more Mass Effect in the morning, see how that continues to go. Everybody watch the state of play tomorrow. When you hear this, you already would have, so that was terrible advice. But yeah, we're going to get out of here. Make sure you check out the rest of the content we have on Super Game Brothers. Gaming Top Down is where I do my board game stuff. If you want to check that out, join our giveaway for June. I mentioned you can either get or a Calcum or a $50 gift card. Check us out on Patreon if you could at patreon.com slash supergamebrothers. All of that stuff helps us a ton to, um, yeah, kind of be friends with the algorithms and meet new people so that we can do this long term. Really appreciate you. And without any more ado... We will see you on the next one. Bye. Bye-bye.